Well, good morning, everyone. Can I invite you to uh, welcome you to the 23rd and final meeting in 2012 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee? Can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones and Blackberries <coughs> as they do affect the broadcasting system? Agenda item one is decision on taking business in private. Uh, can I seek the committee's approval to take agenda item six and seven in private? Agenda item six is consideration of a draft report on the LCM on the Marine Navigation Bill. And agenda item seven is our approach to scrutinising the Fourth Road Bridge Bill. Members agreed? Agreed. That is agreed. Thank you. <coughs> agenda item two is on transport. Um, we are to receive an update on major transport projects from the Minister of Transport and Veterans. So can I welcome Keith Brown and his supporting officials from Transport Scotland, Ainsley McLaughlin, Director of Major Transport Infrastructure Projects, Aidan Greaswood, Director of Rail, and Archie Stoddart, Transport Strategy Team Leader. Minister, would you like to make some opening remarks? Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Can I start off by talking, if I could, about cycling, um, to say that we are providing significant investment for cycling infrastructure across Scotland. I know the committee has been looking at this recently. Uh, we're doing that in both urban and rural areas with an additional £20.25 million over the next three financial years. That was announced in February this year. And a further £6 million was announced on the 20th of September. And that, of course, is in addition to the £15 million over the next three years in the budget line for wider, sustainable and active travel initiatives. Uh, our transport objectives are uh, analogous with the government's aim to create conditions for families to flourish, to improve our social cohesiveness and to allow our businesses to prosper. Uh, and obviously an efficient, well-connected and sustainable transport system is a key uh, uh, enabler of delivery on increasing sustainable economic growth uh, in a low-carbon economy for the whole of Scotland. And that's why we've invested over £8 billion in transport infrastructure and services since 2007, uh, which in turn, of course, uh, helps protect and grow our economy. Uh, we invest this money to create employment and to stimulate growth, to create conditions of advantage and opportunity. We also invest to allow businesses access to a skilled workforce and to deliver goods and services to markets. And we invest as well so that our people are able to move freely for work, for education and for leisure. Uh, we've committed a £5 billion, a £5 billion programme of investment in Scotland's railways, for example, between 2014 and 2019. And £3 billion of that will be in capital investment. Uh, as a government, we uh, disagree with the Chancellor's programme of austerity, of cuts and of backtracking. After failing to generate growth with his own plans, the Chancellor has had to accept the logic, we believe, of our argument and follow the actions of Scotland by investing more of the budget into building projects that will bring jobs and boost the economy, as well as providing lasting benefits in the way of infrastructure. And part of the reason for that is if you invest in things like transport and housing, another concern of the committee, then of course these are labour-intensive areas to um, invest in. Uh, now, the argument is, of course, about borrowing. Borrowing is perhaps parts of the, a large part of the problem which the UK faces, but borrowing for the right reasons to invest in economic assets, we believe, is right and proper. Um, it brings lasting benefits in the way of infrastructure. It creates economic assets. It puts people into employment. They then uh, receive wages instead of uh, uh, seeking benefits and obviously pay tax as well. So there's a virtuous cycle created there. So we are very proud of the programme of capital investment which has already delivered, for example, the Airdrie to Bathgate line, uh, creating new services between Edinburgh and Glasgow and for communities right along that route. We have delivered the M74 motorway extension across the south of Glasgow, eight months ahead of schedule and £17 million below budget. We are delivering a new fourth crossing, Scotland's biggest infrastructure project in a generation, uh, and I recently launched a campaign to find the future permanent name for the fourth road crossing. Members, if they're interested, can submit their own suggestions before the end of January. Um, the Fife Intelligent Transport Systems on the M90 went live last week, the 4th of December, and this will increase the efficiency and capacity of roads by improving traffic flow and reducing congestion, uh, in turn helping journey time reliability and reducing emissions. Uh, and yesterday, as you mentioned already yourself, Convener, the fourth road bridge bill was introduced to the Scottish Parliament. 
Last week, the 4th of December again, and just a week after, I was in Aberdeen to see ground investigations resumed on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route. Our programme of on-the-ground preparatory works were being advanced significantly with invitation to tender for archaeological surveys worth around £3 million uh, to ensure small to medium businesses have the opportunity to bid for the work. Uh, and opening up the project uh, to smaller scale contractors across Scotland, as well as major national and international organisations. Uh, and less than a year ago, the Scottish Government gave the first ever commitment to duel the A9 between Perth and Inverness. That's to happen by 2025. Already we're seeing progress with preparatory work underway and consultants appointed for the preliminary engineering and environmental work. And we aim to keep up this momentum by giving the public a chance to comment at the early stages of this vital project for the Highlands and Islands, indeed for Scotland as a whole. And that's why I'd encourage everybody with an interest to attend the ongoing two-week roadshow, which stops, in fact, today, 12th of December, at King Yusey, and to help ensure local needs are reflected as we develop the duelling programme. We will also deliver, though, rail improvements between Aberdeen and Inverness and on the Highland Main Line, as well as electrification and the upgrade of railway lines between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Fifteen of the 20 direct trains linking Inverness with Glasgow and Edinburgh are now up to 17 minutes faster. Uh, that's by the December 2012 timetable. Uh, we're implementing a wide range of infrastructure and investment plans geared to su support uh, sustainable economic growth in Scotland as well as trying to encourage modal shift uh, to public transport and to active travel. Uh, the Government's committed substantial funding over the current spending review period to support climate change action, uh, £199.7 million over 2012-13 to 2014-15, to reduce the carbon impact of transport via active travel, low-carbon vehicles and congestion redu reduction. And the £50 million Future Transport Fund announced in January will enable us to better support uh, public transport, low-carbon vehicles and active travel initiatives. So I believe, uh, Convener, that's a proud record of investment in the future of transport in Scotland. If I could just mention briefly, though, before concluding, that uh, I'd like to acknowledge the strong interest that the Committee has taken on the Cycling Action Plan for Scotland and also to apologise for not giving the Committee prior notice of the publication of the CAPS progress report. It was an oversight uh, on our part, and I hope my subsequent letter has given you the information that you require. I'm, of course, happy to provide any further information that you might need. Uh, and I also look forward to continued en further engagement on these issues. So, convener, that's a kind of brief overview, uh, which I hope is helpful to the Committee in setting the general context. And now, of course, try to answer any questions that you might have. OK, thank you very much. Adam, would you like to start? Uh, thanks very much, Convener, and uh, good morning, Minister. Um, could I ask, with a, an overarching question, really, um, what aims and ambitions does the Scottish Government have for uh, Scotland's strategic transport networks, and how are you going to prioritise investment um, to meet those aims and ambitions? A very broad question. I think uh, perhaps giving you some uh, pointers to the answers to that in my opening statement. But I think one thing that strikes me is the extent to which the transport network in Scotland, um, in various parts, has been underinvested in for many decades now. And uh, what we're seeing, I think, if you take, for example, some of the bigger uh, projects, uh, if you look at uh, the Force Road crossing, Airdrie to Bathgate, uh, five billion pounds worth of investment in rail. Also, Borders Rail going to a completely new part of the country, first time in 40 odd years that they've had a rail link uh, there. The investment they were making in ferries and so on. What you're seeing, I think, is, a, is almost like a modernisation of Scotland's um, infrastructure, which is very hard to do at the time when resources are at their tightest. I understand that point, but um, I think what we've tried to say within the government is that because it serves other purposes, this kind of investment in transport, uh, I mentioned the beneficial impact on employment and um, and the economy. Uh, we've, I think we've been quite <coughs> successful in attracting uh, from a reduced pot um, money towards transport projects. And the strategic aim has to be that we improve the links that we have, as I said in my opening statement, so that um, the economic benefit of this is not just because we employ people to build roads or to improve uh, railways, but that we, we free up the links, we make it easier to travel between certain areas. Um, and also that, that helps in terms of uh, movement of, of uh, personnel around the country. They can move for jobs. Uh, you know, we can make sure that uh, businesses can get their goods to market quicker and so on as well. So I think those strategic um, 
the, the overarching uh, imperative is to improve Scotland's transport network as a whole because it helps the economy um, in, in different ways. And within that, you have um, coming down, you've got the, the first of all, on, on roads, you have the, the ability to have uh, the new crossing over the fourth, which is absolutely imperative, leaving aside the condition of the existing bridge at reach capacity, uh, the, its design capacity some years ago, an absolutely strategic uh, link in Scotland. So that uh, had to be um, a, a decision that was taken before. The, again, delayed too long, in my view, the, the, the fourth road crossing. Uh, but that's a decision which we've taken and moved forward and making great progress with. Uh, I've mentioned as well, and perhaps it's something that doesn't always get as much recognition, the fact that uh, this intelligent transport system that we have, I think, is very important. It doesn't sound in its own right as something which is strategic, but if used in the right way, then what it can do is free up um, a, a traffic. It moves sometimes more slowly, but it gets to where it's going more quickly. I know that sounds odd, but it works very well on the M25 and the M40. And I used it myself uh, for the, for when it was first opened last week, and uh, although it was the case that you weren't getting a completely free run uh, across the fourth mm -hmm. into Edinburgh, what you were getting was virtually no stop-start. And that's got a big benefit for the environment, uh, because that's when you get the worst of the um, emissions, when, when traffic stops and starts. So uh, we're seeing more and more of that. So you'll have seen over the last four or five years more and more um, gantries with uh, real-time information between Edinburgh and Glasgow. You've got real-time information now. So I think those things, trying to make sure that the economy is benefiting from an efficient transport network at the same time as trying to drive down on emissions are two uh, key things. But um, uh, And how you prioritise that, obviously we had the STPR which was published before, mm -hmm. uh, which gave us um, a substantial route map as to how we would prioritise investment. And that's, that's um, helped us a great deal because it was the first time there was ever an objective analysis of how to prioritise um, these things by giving the benefits for individual projects as against their costs. Okay, <clears throat> you mentioned the STPR and um, there's also the policies and programmes are set out in the National Transport uh, Strategy, um, which was published in 2006 and the STPR in 2009. Um, can you explain why you, you've chosen not to update these documents since their publication and what are your future plans for doing so? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, a fair question because people build up the expectation that governments will regularly come forward with uh, refreshes or, or new launches of, of um, uh, strategies in that way. But I, I think everybody appreciates that the current situation means that we're operating in a very challenging economic environment. So they understand, of course, that prioritisation of transport investment uh, and greater efficiency in the way that we deliver that is very important. Uh, but I, I am uh, comfortable that in terms of the national transport strategy, rather than having officials being diverted from these uh, functions and being involved in a huge root and branch review of that strategy, that a full paper-based uh, refresh of the national transport strategy um, a, is at this stage not required. I do think there's scope and, and opportunity for us to jointly re uh, revisit the transport and delivery landscape and to continually develop more innovative <coughs> and collaborative ways of working, but I think it's better focused. And if I can give us an example of that, the uh, roads maintenance review, which was something that we, you know, a discrete piece of work which addressed a particular problem. You'll remember the um, audit report which said that there was a substantial backlog both in trunk roads but much more so in terms of local roads. So I think focusing down on those particular issues, which we did with the road maintenance review, eventually proposed 30 very specific uh, actions which we can take to improve what we do there. But also recognise the fact that we're doing that at a time of reducing budgets. I think that that, that kind of work is more valuable than continually refreshing um, strategies which are out there just now. So it's a question of making sure that what we have in terms of... Um, uh, um, the department's time is used most effectively. I think that kind of thing is more effective than continually going back to, to strategies. Thank you. Right, we'll move on to real franchising, Gordon. <coughs> uh, I want to ask about recent changes to the existing rain, rail franchise arrangements. Um, you recently announced that First Group would be given a five-month extension to its 10-year contract to run the franchise which had been due to expire in November 2014. 
why did you decide to extend the franchise and will there be any additional costs to the Scottish Government incurred by this decision? It the reason that we extended to, uh, decided to extend the franchise was simply because of the circumstances of the West Coast mainline uh, fiasco, I think is the best way to describe it. Um, and what the implications of that were that there were, as you know, two reviews launched, the Brown and Laidlaw reviews. Brown's not yet reported, but we'll do so shortly. <coughs> Um, and at the time that happened, the DFT, as well as cancelling the award of the West Coast Main Line, also suspended or paused three other uh, franchise uh, processes. Uh, and also, I think, brought into question a number of other ones about where they now sit um, in terms of uh, how do they progress these other franchises which are coming up the timetable. So given that background and given the fact that, uh, of course, when we heard about this, we immediately go back and we check that make sure that our processes, as best we can, um, are robust enough to um, not be susceptible to the same problems which happened in relation to that. It's only right that we do check that. We felt we had a good process anyway, but in looking at that, it was quite clear that uh, to do things were very important to making sure the process worked. And one was giving yourself enough time around about 20 months we think is right um, and we don't have the scale of the issue that the DFT have they've got I think 14 or more franchises to look at me but just the two right. in future but we have we felt it was very important we gave ourselves enough time and also that we have the necessary resource and Laidlaw and Brown I think are already looking at the, the issue of how much resource the DFT had in terms of expertise to process those uh, franchises so Given that, and given the fact that we still don't know for certain whether Brown might come out and say something which has an impact on the whole franchising process, which may impact on the ScotRail franchise, mm -hmm. um, we thought it was only right, given that we had the seven control periods at the end of the franchise uh, which we are allowed to use, uh, to take more time. That way we can listen to what Brown has to say uh, and assimilate any lessons which might come out of that or any changes which he might recommend to the franchising process. Um, and I think it's, it's one thing that you have to be very careful about is making sure that the process is um, robust enough to withstand challenges, which is not to say, I think this is a very important point given what's happened in other areas of transport, which is not to say that you can stop challenges happening. And there does seem these days to be more of a trend towards people who've had contracts, if they then lose them through a competitive process, challenging that process, mm -hmm. it's their right to do that, and you can't stop that from happening. But what you can do is make sure that your system is robust enough uh, to withstand those kind of challenges. And I think for that reason, we wanted that 20-month period left intact. So we've taken, we talked to the various parties involved, and um, we've taken that extra time. On your point about the cost, there is no additional cost to the Scottish Government uh, in relation to that, which is also important to recognise when we're getting so much out of that uh, addition to the franchise. I've mentioned already uh, in the statement last week to Parliament about the deal we've managed to strike on fares, where um, we seem to be setting the trend that the UK Government sometimes follows afterwards. First of all, they were RPI plus 3%, we were RPI plus 1%. Uh, we're looking now to have reduced that to um, RPI, uh, or they then moved, the UK government then moved to RPI plus one. Uh, we are looking to move to nothing above inflation uh, with certain uh, caveats. So we've driven that, but there's also a number of additional services and uh, other benefits which will come with the current uh, contractor first group uh, in terms of ScotRail. So uh, we think that's a very good deal for the passenger, um, but the main driving force for seeking that extension in fact, it's not really an extension, it's just using the contingency, or part of the contingency right. period was to make sure we've got the time and space necessary to get it absolutely right. It's good, good to hear there's not going to be any additional cost to the Scottish Government of that extension. Uh, you touched on the subject of uh, fares, um, and you announced that peak fares will be capped, as you said, in January 2014 and January 2015 to RPI, and the off-peak fares would be frozen. Can you outline why this decision was taken and will there be any effect on unregulated fares like season tickets? Uh, well, I'll maybe ask uh, Aidan to come in on, on some of those points, but the, the reason for doing that is because obviously the formula which is there just now um, builds into the process above inflation rises and we recognise the economic situation. On the one hand, you do have the tension from having to draw in as much money as possible to make the improvements that you want to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and bear in mind that around 75 pence <coughs> every pound that, a, passion, that a, a ticket costs is borne by the government just now, and one quarter borne by the, the fair-paying passenger uh, on average. 
Uh, but notwithstanding that, we did feel that um, continual above inflation rises um, are very difficult for the public to, to bear, even though ours have grown at a much lesser rate than um, the, the UK. Um, so that was the reason why we took that. Uh, that uh, and also the, the point about off-peak, and you might have seen the announcement which I made about the next franchise. Um, now, the next franchise we're looking to um, actually reduce to zero the increases in terms of off-peak. And the reason for that, the rationale, is that the railway is an expensive thing to provide and the demands on it tend to be for commuting. And yet we have all this capacity out with peak hours. Mm -hmm. And if we can try and, through a sort of process of demand management, try and encourage people to use the railways much more... Um, preferably new business to use the railways um, out with the peak hours, then uh, we can grow the use of the railways and it helps the whole uh, package. I don't know if you want to come in on that as well, Aidan. If it was on. I think that's something to just say in terms of the next franchise, it's RPI minus one. Is yeah. the, uh, the unregulated? And on, on unregulated, where, um, where we have unregulated fares, such as flexi passes, for example, um, the commercial reality is that if you shift the... Um, um, the, the, the price of um, the regulated fares, for example, for commuters, then inevitably the flexi pass, because, you know, the commercial realities are such that you need to uh, look at the, uh, the cost of those anyway and, 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 and um, adjust those accordingly simply in order for those to become um, value for money for the, the passenger and, com and a commercial proposition in themselves. So even where there's unregulated fares, in principle, the reality is, is they're often driven by um, the regulated basket anyway. Okay. Um, moving on to the um, West Coast Main Line. Um, it's been announced that Virgin Rail Group uh, would be awarded the contract to operate the West Coast Intercity franchise from the 9th of December to the 8th of November 2014. Um, what discussions did you have with the UK government on the extension of the interim arrangements for the provision of the service uh, by uh, Virgin Trains prior to the announcement? Uh, none at all, actually. I think the, the only discussions which we've had are each time that the UK government is about to announce something, I'll usually get a call to say in five minutes' time, expect a call from the relevant minister mm. and to be told um, in a fairly scripted form what's been agreed. Um, however, each time that's happened, I've made a number of points to uh, the relevant minister to say, first of all, that you know this is a vitally important service for Scotland. Uh, the UK and Scottish governments regularly discuss things which are kept confidential between them. I'm not aware of any outstanding issues about not keeping confidences. Um, and I've, I've made this point, even when it's market-sensitive information, we're a responsible government. Um, but I think it's, these decisions are much more likely to be robust if they're taken with the interests of stakeholders. And the Scottish government's a very big stakeholder in terms of the, uh, the West Coast uh, main line. Uh, so it's been regrettable there hasn't been that level of uh, consultation. Uh, well, I think we've, we've shown some <coughs> understanding of the difficulties which um, the DFT has had in those discussions and also how they try and resolve that because they have European um, imperatives that they're not allowed to, to breach as well. So we've been trying to be, as I think, uh, as helpful as possible. But as of yet, we still don't seem to have got through the point to the UK government that... Um, some discussion, or even being told a little bit in advance of what's liable to come out, uh, would be just the right way to go about things. So I've made that point a number of times um, to Simon Burns uh, and to Patrick McLaughlin uh, on one occasion, and hopefully that message will start to start to get through. I mean, I, I, I was being told, uh, you know, as if this was some revelation that these were the things that the statement was going to contain, just in case. People asked about it. Now, at the time I was being told it, it had already been in all the Scottish newspapers already. And I'm trying to impress upon the UK government that, that, that that's that's mm -hmm. reality. So we can be asked questions about the latest statement from the UK government before it's made. The rest of the world will know, and we will not be told by the UK government. So I think it's just maybe. I mean, the people that are there now are fairly new in post. The ministers has been a fairly big change there. But we keep trying to make the point if they can have the discussions then we can get to a better place and we can be trusted to have those discussions in confidence. OK, thanks very much. OK, if we move on to high-speed rail in Egypt, um, Alex? Uh, yes, there have been a lot of exciting announcements in relation to the Edinburgh Glasgow uh, infrastructure. We had the announcement in July that the 
Egypt project would go ahead but with a reduced budget. And then last month with the announcement that uh, we're going to look at high-speed rail in the longer term. So given that, that more recent announcement, has there been any reassessment of the objectives of the Egypt project in light of the, the proposal for high-speed rail? Uh, no, I think the announcement which you mentioned, which was uh, £650 million pounds of investment, was announced with um, an understanding of how that might impact, what we're going to do, how that might impact, and how we can best facilitate future development in terms of high-speed rail. So it was done with that in mind, and that's meant that it's not in itself necessitated a reassessment where we've come to the conclusion on the high-speed rail announcement between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Uh, the two things are complementary. And I think it's worth saying in relation to the uh, Egypt uh, budget, uh, an awful lot of attention and quite um, uh, quite rightly is focused on the, the top line figure of £650 million of investment because the figure of £1 billion had been mentioned mm -hmm. before that. But I think it's only right that the government tries to get more uh, for its money. And what we have said is that the other elements of Egypt uh, were not being um, uh, cancelled. Um, in fact, I was able to say last week that, for example, the Dunblane and Alawa parts of uh, the electrification project, the advanced works were going ahead. And it's always been our view that those things will proceed in the next phase. Uh, I think it's also true to say, again, something that's perhaps not got the attention it deserves is the fact that even that original announcement, the £650 million, included 100 kilometres of further electrification proceeding out with that project uh, every, every year. It's part of the high level output mm -hmm. specification. It's part of the use um, yeah. announced a couple of weeks before. So those things um, you know, are going ahead, and I think what was quite evident to me was that the extent to which we can get more for our money, and that £650 million announcement delivered around 80% uh, during that first period of the original intentions of Egypt, and the other 20% was to follow. So, uh, And I think we're starting to see ways in which that further 20% can be um, brought within that kind of... Well, the time scale perhaps not quite as quickly, but it's still possible... I mean, the H loss takes effect from 2014 to 2019. The, uh, the Egypt programme is obviously over the next uh, five years itself. So I, I think it was just making sure we had the right um, level of financing. And also, part of it was about um, trying to anticipate uh, high speed rail. If we didn't do that, if we didn't try and anticipate that and were serious about high speed rail, then we wouldn't be taken seriously by. Uh, the UK government in terms of our intentions. We're trying very hard to get the UK government to commit to high-speed rail coming to Scotland. And if we're not doing... Uh, when I had the meeting with uh, Justin Greening, you know, the question comes up, well, what are you doing? How is it going to come from Scotland? What's Scotland's contribution to this going to be? So I think we are duty-bound to start to show how we can adapt to high-speed rail. And I think showing that ambition in terms of the high-speed rail link between Edinburgh and Glasgow helps our case to make sure that... Um, not just that Scotland benefits from it, but that large part of the north of England, which will otherwise be left out, um, its interests can be taken into account as well. And that's why we've developed the partnership that we have done with the local authorities in the, in the north of England. So the two things, the Egypt announcement and the high-speed rail announcement, I think are entirely complementary and one anticipated the other. Before I leave the Egypt uh, issue, the reduction in budget from the, the initial billion to the 650 uh, million uh, has a corresponding reduction in uh, what you want to achieve within that. And you talked about getting more value for money, but yet I've spoken to people who suggest that the reduced budget and the reduced objectives actually represents less value for money than could have been achieved if the whole thing had been done at once. How do you react to that? Well, I just flatly disagree. And I would also say it's not a corresponding reduction because if you look, say you go from a billion to £650 million, you're taking about a third of that budget out. And I've just said that we expect we will get 80% at least. And that figure is changing, and it's changing upward. Um, and we're pushing for it to change upward. 80% at least of the benefits and the projects that would have arisen from a, a billion pound programme we took other advice uh, on that at the time from consultants, and we think there are substantial efficiencies. Just to give you one example, we and it was over in Paisley was it yesterday, it was, no, the day before in Paisley for the electrification project there. Now that would normally cost uh, around 28 million pounds a project that we did to electrify the Paisley Canal line. That would normally cost, and the industry expected around 28 million pounds. 
And what we've done with Network Rail and with Scott Rail um, is to challenge that. In fact, it's probably fair to say they've led it, um, Network Rail and Scott Rail. And it's the first time it's happened in the UK with a different process. And actually, they went out to the market and said, look, we're doing this in a different way in terms of the usual constraints you have when you do this kind of project. Um, so bid for it in a different way. And the bid came in as it normally did. It was no different. And they had to go back and say, no, this has been done in a different way. For example, it was a lot to do with how you drive the piles for um, the electrification uh, pillars, if that's the right technical term for them, um, and also how you take possession of the, the railway itself. Now, that came in at £12 million, pounds, that, and it was done in you know record time. So £12 million, pounds, that kind of project has big implications <coughs> for how you might do Egypt. You might get an awful lot more for you, the money that we've announced. And also, I think the rest of the UK is now sat up and took notice of what happened in Paisley, and we'll look to do that as well. So I think it is, I would disagree with the people that are saying to you we're going to get less, uh, corresponding to less um, for that money, and I think it's exactly the opposite. We'll get far more for that money. Moving on to the proposal for a high-speed railway between the two cities, the, I wanted to explore just where we are to see what information is available just now. For a start, do you have a, an, an outline timetable for the development of high-speed rail between Edinburgh and Glasgow? Well, you've been given by the Deputy First Minister the, the long-stop date of 2024, mm. but these things, as she said at the time, are being worked on in terms of design, in terms of routes, in terms of costs. So, um, and it's worth saying that I know that attracted some criticism, not least, I think, from yourself. Mm -hmm. I'll Johnson. always be in there. <laughs> However, that uh, criticism doesn't appear to apply to the UK government. We've put no cost in terms of the, or no business case together for the, uh, some parts of the high-speed rail line that they've talked about. So um, I think you have to agree, first of all, what it is that you want to do. And of course, you'll be bound by that. We'll be bound by the... Um, by the timescale that's been announced, but we then have to go away and work on that. And we've said that quite clearly. I don't know if you want to come in on that as well, Aidan, but it's, it's a normal process of doing these things. Yeah, just in terms of in terms of the, the timetable, you know, we commissioned a little bit of work in terms of um, getting a, a feasible programme, and that's what the announcement was around, essentially saying that was, this was feasible to do within the timescale that was um, set out. Um, so in terms of the details of that, that's something that, um, where um, we can make available to, to the committee if they find that useful. So it would be fair to say that we're some <laughs> way away from knowing what the, the costs and what the route uh, of this line would likely to be. Yeah, and, and that's the, that, that's, in a sense, is it, this is the, yes. the starting point for the planning, which is precisely looking at route options um, for that Edinburgh-Glasgow mm -hmm. um, route and also putting together an outline business case um, mm -hmm. for that as well. On the, a slightly different subject, have you looked into the funding mechanisms that may be used for this, or have you any thoughts on how it might be funded? Well, it obviously, given the time scale, um, obviously the, the RAB, the resource asset base that Network Rail have, the borrowing facility, uh, just to point out uh, once again the absurdity of a situation where the Scottish Government can be funding these massive projects, including uh, going back to roads, the fourth road crossing, without substantial borrowing powers, less borrowing powers than uh, a small council in Scotland would have. So we have to fund these things sometimes from current budgets. But the resource asset base of Network Rail means that they can borrow what the Scottish Government can't to fund these things. And obviously we have to do these in chunks at a time. So that that option to use the resource asset base up to 2024 to fund this will be there. Uh, but there's no, again, as Aidan said, we're looking at the business cases now. We'll report our findings back on that in 2014, and we'll have uh, substantially more detail in terms of how much we can put into it. We don't know at this stage what our budgets are going to be, um, you know, in the next spending review period, so we can't be as definitive. Um, we can't be definitive in a way that nobody else can be. The UK government can't be definitive about some of these things as well. It's not laid out how it intends to pay for the high-speed rail uh, links that it's already committed to. Uh, but I would imagine it's, it's going to be um, the usual options, which are of um, uh, using the resource asset base of Network Rail plus the other resources which the government may be able to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. How do you see the project tying in both in terms of uh, potential construction and possibly even funding mechanisms with uh, the development of a high-speed ra rail line to the south? Well, I think that's a very good question because I think if we can try and encourage the UK government, and I hope the announcement itself will help to encourage the UK government to try and tie these things together, then of course the efficiencies and the economies of scale will make it more uh, attractive, so such that 
we've always said that if the UK government agrees to a high-speed rail link coming all the way to Scotland, as we believe it should, and just to repeat the point we made previously, that uh, we think high-speed rail, as proposed by the UK government, makes sense, but it makes much more sense if it comes all the way to Scotland, both in terms of the business community, for a joined-up UK network, and also for the benefits for the environment, because you have that uh, modal shift that really occurs if you have uh, Edinburgh, Glasgow to London uh, coming down to below three hours, then people really will move in substantial numbers from air travel mm -hmm. to, to to rail travel. So if we can encourage the UK government to agree that point, and we did get to the point with Justine Greening of her agreeing uh, that we would be able to interact for the first time with High Speed Rail 2, the company itself, um, if we can get them to that point, then it makes it... Uh, much more attractive to start the uh, process in Scotland, either in advance of or, you know, at the same time as the uh, process has been started elsewhere, both in terms of design and even construction. So it, the extent to which it fits together is not all within our gift. It depends a lot on the UK government stance. And it's my view that uh, if they take a constructive approach, we can all win out of this process by driving down the costs of what we do. Just sort of as an aside on this, the the normal assumption is that the definition of high speed rail relates to trains that will perform a minimum of 186 miles an hour, and yet the announcement that was made in relation to Edinburgh Glasgow talked of trains doing 140 miles per hour. Is there an inconsistency there, or am I, or am I misunderstanding? Well, I think, I mean, I'll maybe ask you in the coming, one point is trying to get a train up to 180 miles mm -hmm. an hour between Edinburgh and Glasgow is not an easy <laughs> thing to do. Um, but I don't know if Aidan wants to come back on the technical side of that. Yeah, it's not too technical on that basis. It's fundamental. By the time you actually get to that, that you know, that speed, you'd have to be yeah. slamming on the brakes. Um, yes. You'd always be going for the buffers at, uh, uh, at Glasgow. So there's the, the, the technical realities of, you know, of, 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 of the short distance mm -hmm. between the two cities. But again, it links into your previous question about linkages with the um, with the high speed link coming from from um, from England, mm -hmm. um, where if, by make the decision about the services between Edinburgh and Glasgow, um, once you've got that <coughs> in place, you're also future proofing it for mm -hmm. services that are coming from the South of England, which would be, you know, would be designed to be compatible with high speed trains um, subsequently. Yeah. Now, on a slightly more serious note, uh, what would the position be? in terms of the procurement of rolling stock to do that job between Edinburgh and Glasgow at high speed. Has that been included in your uh, projections or is that something that still has to be considered near the time? I mean, yes, is the straightforward answer. It will depend um, on other factors as well, other developments during the next franchise that we have. But as I've said, I think what we're doing is uh, we've established that ambition to do this. The work, the detail work, and that will include rolling stock is being done over the course of 2013, and we'll report what we come back with in 2014. Mm. The, what worries me slightly there is that we're looking at a situation where we, we may be bringing in uh, new, uh, higher performing rolling stock in relation to the Egypt project and then having to replace them again with faster, better trains mm. uh, relatively soon afterwards. Is that uh, economically justifiable? Well, you wouldn't have to replace the ones which are used on the electrified Edinburgh to Glasgow line. Uh, mm -hmm. The high-speed uh, rail would be an additional capacity, so yes. you'd buy specifically for that. But the ones on the, um, again, dependent on what the, the, the findings of the studies that we're doing show. So it is an additional line, it's not. So mm -hmm. you, would, you would have to have your capacity on Egypt, which, you know, 2016-17, we're looking to have uh, Egypt up and running. You'd have to have specific rolling stock for that and you would additionally have you wouldn't have to upgrade the stuff resulting from Egypt just because you've established the high speed rail link mm -hmm. if, if that answers your point yeah. thank you very much um, move on now to winter resilience Margaret you've got a question on this yeah, I've got two questions Minister um, one, the first one is regarding local authorities um, are you satisfied that local authorities are sufficiently prepared to deal with the effects of any severe winter weather on the local road network? Yeah, I think first of all, I would have to give the caveat that, caveat that I can't answer for local authorities. You have to really answer for themselves. Uh, and that comes down to things like the provisions they put in place, whether it's establishing enough um, salt uh, or other material stock. Uh, the uh, runs that they'll do for gritting roads, for example, those are decisions for local authorities, and I can't answer mm -hmm. um, on their behalf. 
What I can say is that they do work very closely with us through um, a structure which is called SCGs, um, uh, so a, a local um, co collaborations of different local authorities and other agencies. We do work very closely with them. And in some places, for example, in Aberdeenshire, uh, Aberdeen itself, and in Dumfries and Galloway, sometimes the trunk road gritters will grit local roads and vice versa, uh, according to a contract. Um, and I do know that in terms of, for example, the salt stocks, we have a salt cell um, which looks at these things, which also makes sure that we have a sufficient strategic reserve that we have uh, across the whole of Scotland. Uh, as I said, I think in the chamber uh, in the last fortnight, uh, more salt than was used during the entire period of the 2010-11 winter. So I have that satisfaction of knowing that's the case, but I don't take decisions on individual um, route planning in terms of, uh, of gritting. And I think the overarching thing is that uh, the resource that we give to local government, of course, is difficult in these times, but that's still uh, higher as a proportion of... Um, the Scottish Government's overall budget than it was in 2007. So we are giving the resources that we can to that, but local authorities have to take their own decisions in relation to that. But the information I have suggests that they are better equipped than ever before. OK, and my next question is, in previous years, trans transport information systems have been unable to cope during times of severe weather or have provided incorrect or conflicting information. Can you give assurances that this won't happen in the future when we have the severe weather conditions? Well, again, first of all, we don't control all the systems by which people get information about the transport um, uh, transport system. Um, I think you're right to say there were problems before, whether it was ones that we delivered ourselves or more generally. I mean, radio stations, for example, will give out something which somebody phones up and tells them about. Um, now, they want to get that information out immediately, but they don't always have the time to verify that. We really, before we give information out, we have to verify it, so it takes a bit of time to do that. Um, but I think, generally speaking, we are far better prepared through uh, Traffic Scotland and also the stuff we now do on social networks as well by getting information out as quickly as, as we possibly can. You'll also see much more information, for example, Two years ago, you wouldn't have had the journey time information on the gantries between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Now, those things are collaborations between the local authorities and the trunk road network. Uh, we make them as accurate as we can, but circumstances change. Um, but I think even things like being able to go on now to the appropriate website or to use the app, which is there, and see when a particular road was last or next gritted is, is, is an advance in information, and also the availability of um, uh, weather forecasting as well. Um, I think it's much more available than it was in the past. So no system is fail-safe, but there's been a substantial additional capacity. Uh, one vital area was in terms of rail in 2010-11. You're right, I mean, the system did not cope with everything that happened then. But since that time, there's been a huge amount of uh, investment by ScotRail and Network Rail into making sure those systems are better able to cope. So I think it's vastly improved, but no system is fail-safe. And just, this is just a personal question. Do you have the name of that app that we could actually <laughs> download and use? I'm sure we can get to it. We'll send it to the whole yeah. committee because we did do a presentation to some other MSPs and I think three or four of them immediately downloaded mm -hmm. it. So yeah. we'll send that, unless Aidan's got it with him just now, uh, but we'll send it mm -hmm. on to every member of the committee. And the people that have used it have said how beneficial it is mm -hmm. as well. So we'll pass that on. Lovely, thank you. OK, move on to cycling, Jim. Uh, good morning, Minister. Um, I return to one of my favourite subjects. Um, I don't intend to rehearse the funding arguments which have been well aired, comprehensively aired during the course of the committee's uh, deliberations. And of course, I had an extensive exchange with the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Infrastructure on this issue. Uh, suffice to say, though, that when the cycling organisations gave evidence to this committee, to a man and a woman, they said that the government's ambitious target of 10% of all journeys by bicycle by 2020 would not be achieved on current levels of funding. And I'm mindful that that was evidence given by Sustrans and Cycling Scotland, two organisations that you work very closely with. Now, I know we've had £6 million since, um, fair enough, um, but can you tell us how your discussions with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, for Finance are uh, progressing? Uh, in the wake of last week's um, autumn statement and the, the fact that we now have um, Barnet consequentials available and 3.9 million um, cycling shovel-ready projects for cycling identified. 
Uh, yeah, first of all, I think just to be clear about the target, it's not the government's target, it's a shared target with the different stakeholders. It's always been that way. So we expect that local authorities and others will also contribute towards that target. We, of course, have part ownership of that as well. In fact, I'm not sure it was ever described as a target when first, first set. But uh, you're, you're right to say it provides a very useful ambition for us to have, and we are working hard to achieve that. And I think it's always going to be the case that it's slower at the start. What we have seen is substantial progress in terms of uh, recreational cycling, not really necessarily for things just that we've done, but because of Sir Chris Hoy and the Olympics and so on, you've seen a huge increase. What we've not seen as such good progress on is the commuting, people actually taking the option to, to cycle to work and back. And we understand that we've got a large part to play in that, and that's why there's been the announcement, for example, in A90 for Edinburgh to close the missing link there for the cycle network. And also the, work that, the monies that we've announced for Glasgow, which will help um, both commuting and during the Commonwealth Games for people to get around by bike. And individuals will have to make that choice to, to do that. Um, I think it's important that we take the responsibility of, of um, providing the infrastructure for that and also do what we can to um, concentrate on the fact that the option to choose cycling is something which people find it easier to do, in particular children. Uh, you'll be aware of the work we've done to try and put more money into ensuring that every child gets a chance to get on-road cycle training, which is crucially different from uh, you know, playground-based or, 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 or uh, paper-based exercises, if you like. And, and I think that what that will do will reassure the parents that they can let children use uh, bikes much more frequently. And the benefit there, as you well know, is that uh, what you'll then get is parents not choosing to make that short, environmentally damaging journey in the car to go to school. All sorts of benefits from that. You asked about the point about discussions with the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into, obviously, the detail of that, but I know the meeting that you've had yourself with him, and since that time I have spoken as well. Can I say that I've always found, in terms of cycling, um, John Swinney to be very receptive to the arguments that we've made. I remember saying to a very large demonstration at St Andrew's House a couple of years ago that I intended to continue to argue for any consequentials uh, or any other monies which are available, and I think we've had a very good track record since then. And just to say, in conclusion, one final point why that I think is so attractive is because if its infrastructure works, what it tends to be is much more geographically spread around the country and it allows small, smaller businesses to bid for this work. If you get a big contract like the Force Bridge, of course it's big, uh, often international consortia which bid for that, but these smaller projects which are capital intensive, labour intensive uh, and very local uh, provide real benefits around the country and my previous discussions with John Swinney have very much centred on that, and he's very aware of that fact. Yes, and, and I know that um, um, when I met, along with the other co-convener of the cross-party group on cycling, Alison Johnson, last week with the Cabinet Secretary, he um, asked for examples of what exemplar projects uh, might look like. So I guess what I'm asking you is, in terms of timescales, when can we expect an announcement on the shovel-ready projects of which cycling would be a, a part? Well, I can't say that because it's not my announcement to make, although I expect to input to it, but it'll be John Swinney that will announce that. Well, the end of this year, next well, year? Well, it's, it's John, it's John Swinney's kind of decision to make. Sir. Sorry? Are you able to give us any indication? Well, no, it's going to be John Swinney's process to go through. So, I mean, he's already announced the, the shovel-ready projects which we had previously, for example, including the I think £35 million pounds for road maintenance, which helps yeah. uh, in terms of active travel. So it's his decision to make, and it's him that will have to give that commitment. All I'm saying is that I will make sure that the arguments for cycling are heard, and every time I've made those arguments, I've had a, a welcome response from Mr Swinney. OK. Um, can I ask you uh, about the, cat, the Cycling Action Plan for Scotland? Mm -hmm. um, government is currently committed to publishing... We've had a monitoring report in November of this year. You're committed to publishing the refresh... Mm -hmm in the spring of next year, can we have a reassurance that that time scale will not slip? Yeah, there's no intention that it should uh, slip. That's what we intend to do. We're talking about spring next year, uh, yes. announcing that, and that's, there's no change to that intention. OK. Um, the record will, will uh, record that. The issue of political leadership, if I can fi uh, finish on this point, um, which is something I think that you recognise both nationally and locally. Uh, when the co-conveners of the cross-party Group on Cycling wrote to you. We made a plea that you would that you should convene um, the a regular meeting of the 32 uh, council 
leads on cycling, those with a portfolio responsibility for cycling in each of the local authorities. Now, we've had some sympathetic words and response, and I'm grateful to you for the comprehensive um, response that you provided across a range of issues um, within the Cycling Action Plan for Scotland. But can we have a commitment that you will consider convening that type of summit of political uh, uh, of uh, council leads so that we can have the political leadership at a local level? Well, I, I think I've made the point before that the 10% um, the uh, ambition is not ours alone. And I think what I've said in my response is that I have no problem with doing that and we will do what we can to facilitate that. I know how difficult it can be in other areas, veterans, for example, to get all 32 councils round the table at the same time. Uh, I think what I've said to to uh, you and, and Talis and Johnson, my response is we've got no problem with that. We will go, we will facilitate that. We will try and make it happen. The point you make about political leadership is, and it's an important point, and it's not trying to shift responsibility. If we have leadership uh, dispersed amongst different partners who can contribute to this, there's more chance of success rather than just the 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 unedifying sight of me in a bike between Edinburgh and Glasgow, um, you know, political leadership has to be shared in relation to this. And I think that's why what, what I've said in my response to you is we'll work with local authorities to achieve that. I've got no problem at all, and I can see the benefits in sitting down with the 32 uh, council uh, spokespeople, uh, if that's not the, the wrong term to use in this context, but to speak to them to try and advance that. Um, so, yes, as I've said to you, we've got no problem with that, and we'll try and make it happen. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we move on to uh, Scottish Ferries Plan and review of... Um, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Uh, Emmy, completion, Adam, that's you, sorry. Okay, can you provide an update on the M8 completion project for us? Uh, well, I, I mentioned, I think, in a, an answer to a, a, a member last week in the Chamber, the uh, updated timetable for that. It hasn't um, changed substantially, and it is exa almost exactly the same kind of time scale that we would have in relation to another project of that size. One of the factors, though, we do have to take into account is it will be uh, under construction at the same time as the Commonwealth Games, and that's made some changes to the way that we're going to go about things. But uh, perhaps... Um, uh, we can get an update from the officials on uh, the timetable just now, if that's all right. Yeah, um, <clears throat> just last week we uh, received the first round of bids for the four, uh, from the four tenderers. Uh, and over the next uh, couple of months we'll be um, examining those bids with intention to deselect two uh, and move forward to the final stage, <coughs> probably around uh, February, March, uh, to bring forward the final bids um, in uh, June, July, uh, and then announce a preferred bidder with a view to getting uh, construction underway uh, late uh, 2013. And uh, the budget is uh, <coughs> max, uh, a maximum cap on the budget has been set, is that right? I mean, in common with all these uh, uh, projects, we put what we think is, is out there and uh, we see what happens as a result of the tenders. It's worth bearing in mind, for example, on the fourth crossing, we put up a budget out there of a, between, I think, £1.7 and £2.3 billion, pounds, and the actual tender came in hugely below that, yeah. um, between, I think, £1.4 and £1.7 billion pounds or thereabouts. So we can't be definitive about the, the actual cost until we get the tenders back. But, uh, yes, we have put the, the budget figure out there. Yeah. I mean, there are dangers in that. You don't want people to bid up to what the budget is no. available. But um, it, it is very clear just now that companies are hungry for this work. And we had massive interest in the industry day that we held for the M8. I mean, the room was absolutely packed out. So there's no question the industry's got an appetite for this work. And we hope that appetite will mean that they are going to bid very keenly for it. OK. OK. Now, you mentioned the... the problem of the construction during the, the Commonwealth Games. Uh, can you give us uh, an indication of the steps Transport Scotland intend to take to keep disruption to a minimum um, during what is, after all, a major project affecting uh, Scotland's busiest transport corridor? Yes, I mean, I'll maybe again get Ainsley to come in on the detail of it, but what we've tried to do is try to ensure that there isn't disruption. Um, what we can't do is hide the fact that construction will be going on at that time. It may sound a, an odd thing to say, but the, 
the fact will be that people coming to this country will realise mm. there's a large construction project uh, underway. They'll see that. But what we've tried to concentrate on is making sure they don't feel that in terms of delayed journey times or, or congestion. But uh, again, if I could ask Ainsley to say some of the detail about that. Um, yeah, a lot of the construction will be offline, particularly the sections between, <coughs> excuse me, between uh, Bayless and Newhouse. So that wouldn't have a, a direct impact on people using the existing road network. Um, the contract itself will require two lanes to be kept open at all times. Um, we can't guarantee there won't be cones to peep, uh, on the network uh, yeah. approaching Glasgow when the games are on. But we have uh, uh, worked with the organising committee to understand where the pinch points are for the games. And, and in terms of the M8 contract, those are around the Strathclyde Park area. So we're taking particular measures around the upgrade to Wraith interchange to make sure that they don't impact on people coming, going in and out to uh, those, that venue. But the rest of the venues for the Commonwealth Games are remote largely from this site. Okay. Um, um, so we're, we're, we're working hand in hand with the organising committee to ensure uh, minimum disruption. Okay, very good. Perhaps we can <coughs> return to this in the, in the new year. Okay. I'll just add, if I could, that yesterday I went to um, London to talk to TfL Transport for London about the, how they'd managed uh, the process for the Olympics, which I think by popular acclaim has been extremely successful. And one of the things that they had done was to anticipate the works which they had scheduled. Now, smaller works you can obviously just delay. Mm. Um, we don't want to delay the ME project, we want to crack on with that. So it's a question of accommodating it at the same time. As Angie said, a lot of it is offline. Um, but just to mention that, because we've learnt an awful lot from the discussions we had yesterday with uh, TfL about how they organise these things. That's good. Okay. <laughs> we move to ferries now. Um, can you provide us with an update on the Scottish Ferries Plan and the associated vessel renewal and investment plans and tell us when these might be published? Uh, well, uh, just to confirm what I've said before, it will be published by the end of the year. Um, and you can probably work out when that We're will be. We're running out of time. Yes. <laughs> well, we will, we will publish by the end of the year. Just to confirm, we'll do that exact day. is still to be determined, but it will be very soon. OK. Um, the, the draft ferries plan proposed that Scottish ministers take responsibility for the provision of ferry services currently provided by local authorities, if those authorities agreed to such a takeover. Um, has the Scottish Government reached agreement with any authorities to take responsibility for the provision of any of these services? Uh, yeah, I think it's probably true to say the draft plan actually said that we were willing to do that. It didn't propose uh, necessarily that we would do that. And you, as you rightly say, it would only happen as a result of discussions uh, between ourselves and local authorities. Now, it's true to say that different um, circumstances apply if it's in Northern Isles, and we've been involved in pretty substantial discussions with um, Orkney Islands in particular about the ferry services that they have. Um, those discussions are more advanced than they are elsewhere on the network. But we also have discussions with uh, Shetland uh, Islands uh, who want to, I think, I think it's fair to say, want to retain control themselves of the internal ferry services that they have but still want to talk to the Scottish Government about what the possibilities are. What is perhaps a little bit less advanced are the discussions that we're having with Argyll and Butte uh, in the Clayton, um, uh, Clayton Hebrides part of the, the, the ferry network. Um, so, for example, at uh, Kerara, there are discussions not just about the potential service that will be there, which is currently provided by a private operator, but also what infrastructure would have to be put in place. And as you'll uh, appreciate, we've said that uh, we will take on responsibility for these services, but where we currently provide grant to a local authority to provide these services at the present time, we will expect that to be changed to reflect the fact that we're taking over responsibility. So it's not straightforward. There are quite a number of different routes which, uh, again, have individual characteristics in terms of the infrastructure or the frequency of services. Uh, and you'll know that the methodology that we're using throughout the ferries review is to say what exactly is the service that is here and what exactly should be here based on whether it's pr primarily for freight or passengers or recreational or commuting. So that work's ongoing and it's also one of the reasons which underlie the decision that we took to award the interim contract to the um, CalMAC for the Clyde and Hebrides uh, ferry service because we've said uh, and said to the European uh, Commission 
that the new contract is likely to be substantially different because of these additional services that we'll provide. Um, but that work is ongoing just now. We'll have more to say on that in the final ferries plan, but it's not a finished piece of work at this stage. Okay, and can you provide an update on the review of um, freight ferry fares? Um, Do you mean for right. commercial hauliers? Well, yeah, the, well, the road I, equivalent tariff. I think we've resolved that situation, uh, at least in relation to the Northern Isles, because that's part of the contract which we've let with, with Northlink. So freight fares are established uh, there. I think the issue we had before was in the Western Isles, where the RET um, initiative had been looked at once the pilot had expired and we had found that we hadn't got the benefits that we'd expected in terms of the passing on of the benefit uh, to the, the end user. Um, and last year we uh, changed that so that commercial hauliers weren't getting RET, although there was a transitional scheme to limit any increases going back to the original uh, price. What we said at that time is we would have a study at their request to um, get to the bottom of the economic impact for the islands themselves of that decision. That's almost concluded, uh, not quite there yet. <laughs> and we'll shortly announce um, what further transitional support we can provide um, to the Western Isles uh, commercial hauliers to, again, to mitigate any, any rises. Okay, if we move on to greenhouse gas emissions, Malcolm. Can I ask how much weight does the Scottish Government give to carbon reduction when deciding on transport policies, uh, projects and programmes compared to economic and social factors? As you know, transport emissions are actually higher than in 1990, which is the baseline, obviously, for our reduction uh, ambitions, and uh, they are projected to increase further over the next 10 years. Uh, we do give substantial weight to this, and the way that we do that is uh, a, a, a number of different processes. Um, going back to the point that was made before about active travel, when we have large-scale projects now which in themselves can help uh, abate uh, emissions um, by, a, as I've mentioned, a, easing the flow of traffic, but we have construction projects we're trying to build in um, active travel alternatives alongside those, which we did in the M74. We can get to uh, more information on that, if you like, just now. But we're also looking to fund and encourage uh, alternative, much more environmentally friendly forms of transport. So, for example, through establishing the ECOS partnership, which is about low-carbon vehicles, um, we have uh, brought all the key partners together with a shared aim of trying to increase the use of electric vehicles. And it is a difficult... Uh, stage of that process because you inevitably have to try and establish the infrastructure first before people will make the decision to move. So you have the easy hit of people saying, well, you've got more charging points and you have electric vehicles. That's inevitably going to would be the case in the, extra, in, the, in the interim period. So we do take that into account. And the other thing is we're willing to and have helped fund, for example, the hydrogen bus project in uh, Aberdeen. Uh, hugely beneficial for the environment if we can make that uh, work. Um, I've mentioned already the £5 billion programme of investment in the railways, which again uh, is massively beneficial to the environment if we can get modal shift for people uh, moving to railways. So that thinking does uh, permeate um, all the work that we do. We understand that transport and for that matter housing uh, are big um, factors in terms of trying to drive down uh, emissions. So it's very central to our thinking. I don't know if you want to say something in addition to that, Archie. Or... Uh, just to make a, a quick observation, actually carbon dioxide emissions have reduced, but it's the share that's gone up because of what's happening in other sectors and, and, and other factors over that 10-year uh, period. In terms of ECOS, what, this is, an, as the Minister says, an industry-wide partnership that we are looking to pull together a roadmap next year uh, that will publish next year to actually to dramatically increase the take-up of electric vehicles across the piece in Scotland. And we hope that will be a major driver, if you excuse the pun, of reducing as part of our decarbonising transport agenda. I accept that you're doing all of those things. The problem is it seems to be being outweighed by the other aspects of transport uh, policy. I mean, the carbon account for transport came out a few months ago, and that indicates that the net impact of all Scottish transport measures are actually going to increase um, by 71 kilotons of CO2 emissions over the next uh, 10 years. And very interestingly, your own carbon account for transport says the estimated increase is largely driven by a net increase in vehicle uh, kilometres. And I mean, it's, it's particularly interesting, the convener might be interested to know that that's, that is particularly driven by Strathclyde and Aberdeen because of the increase in, um, you know, the, the, road, the, the road building. The, it says the large infrastructure projects 
in those uh, areas. So, I mean, your own report makes that connection, obviously, between the increased vehicle kilometres and uh, road buildings. Uh, road building. And if you compare that with the advice given by the former chair of the UK Committee on Climate Change in his letter to Stuart Stevenson earlier this year, he said it was essential for the Scottish Government to ensure full rollout of measures in devolved policy areas such as demand-side transport. And, of course, it was the demand-side transport measures that were specifically taken out late in the day out of the previous RPP. So it seems as if, notwithstanding all the good things you're doing, it's outweighed by the uh, other aspects of transport policy, particularly um, the road building, which is re leading to the increase in vehicle kilometres, which your own report says is the main driver of increased emissions over the next 10 years. I mean, if we're at, so we're basically in 2022, we'll, we'll have more transport emissions than in 1990, while the rest of the Scottish Government has got to reduce by 80%. Okay, say you mentioned the carbon account for transport. If you look at what tips that over to an increase, uh, one of the factors, one of the main factors, is the building of the Borders Rail project. If you look into the report, it will say to you that uh, you'll actually increase emissions during the construction of that project because it's a new addition to the rail network. But, of course, the longer-term benefits are that that will help reduce quite substantially emissions because of the traffic we can take off road to put onto rail in that context. And also coming back to the point about roads, uh, and I've made the point uh, before that, uh, yes, we are building roads and we believe it's vitally important, for example, the AWPR is built uh, and also the improvements to the M8 given its, its central nature um, to the uh, traffic flows in Scotland. But roads are used by buses, in fact they're going to be used by trams uh, here as well. Um, they're used by cyclists as well, so it's important that we do have a good uh, road network. The, the bigger issue, which I understand underlies uh, uh, Mr Chisholm's question, is about uh, behaviour and the fact that people uh, are reluctant to move out of their cars. I think there is a challenge for us there. The first challenge is to try and give people a, a realistic alternative to doing that. Um, not just that people are willing to use their cars, but they'll very often use them by themselves. Uh, so what we're trying to do, for example, is we've seen a massive increase in car sharing and car clubs. Is to try and increase that trend more so it starts to have an impact on the number of journeys which people decide uh, they want to make and do so on their own. So it's not. I'm not... Uh, pretending it's an easy um, uh, solution, but I do think we first of all have to establish the alternatives. And a very good example of that is the Borders Rail Network, where people who currently will have little opportunity but to use a bus, presumably, um, will have a chance to use, um, rather than a car where they choose to do that, they'll have a chance to use a, a railway service. So it doesn't happen overnight. As I've said already, we think we are about the business of modernising um, a transport network which has been substantially starved of investment, of enough investment over many, many years. Um, and that's that's a slow pro process. But I do think we are making progress. I think the point that was made is now three consecutive years of emissions reductions from transport, although I do acknowledge the point it's above the 1990 base year. But that is, um, that is progress. I think we're continuing to make progress. Well, I mean, I'm not going to repeat what I said. I, I'll just point out that your own report projecting for the next 10 years is in projecting an increase the carbon account for transport. And the key sentence in that um, report in relation to this is that the estimated increase in emissions is largely driven by a net increase in vehicle kilometres. I've made the point about the three consecutive years of emissions reductions. It's worth saying that the Scottish transport statistics are out today. In fact, about an, an hour and a half ago they came out. Um, that shows traffic levels uh, falling in recent uh, years. Car traffic and all road traffic remain stable between 2010 and 2011, a fall of a minor fall of 0.2%, uh, which is 3% below 2007 levels. Um, we do, of course, have more road than the rest of the UK, substantially more road per, per capita, 10.6 uh, kilometres per thousand people uh, compared to 6.4 kilometres. And to go back to the point I made previously, in many cases, especially in rural Scotland, people have no option but to, to, to use those roads roads. Uh, and it's also worth saying that the stats out today will show that um, not only has road fallen, uh, but bus passengers have increased by 2%, uh, rail by 4%, uh, and a, an increase in cycling of 2% as well. So uh, I know that people want to see more progress made in this, but I think we are making progress. It just it takes time uh, to deliver, first of all, the alternatives to the car. And um, that's what we're about. I think we've demonstrated that in Airdrie to Bathgate, Stirling, Allawa, and Cardin, my own area. People can get on a training in Allawa now, um, which they couldn't do before. Um, and I think it just is going to take time to achieve those targets. Okay, if we move on to electric vehicles, then, Margaret. 
Can the Minister provide an update on the development of electric, electric vehicle charging infrastructure across Scotland? And can you give us an indication of how well used this is at present? Uh, well, I think it's uh, proceeding apace. We do this in, in conjunction with the UK Government through Plugged In Places, that, that scheme which we get money from uh, the UK Government and with local authority um, local authority partners as well. So what you've seen is the establishment in the first tranche of, uh, of uh, recharging points, which have been, in many cases, public sector outlets, so uh, local authorities and so on, and not all of which are always completely open to the public. I think what we're now doing is starting to look at um, and introduce over the next year further charging points, which will give people that reassurance. Say that, for example, they wanted to make a journey in an electric vehicle by uh, going from, say, Edinburgh to Aberdeen. Um, having that reassurance that you're not going to run out of charge or that if you are going to run out of charge, you've got a place that you can uh, recharge. So we're starting to have, uh, be um, between cities, we're starting to look at those charging points as a programme to introduce those. And also um, the point that you can charge uh, quickly, because obviously if you want to make that journey, you're going to stop for eight hours, mm -hmm. uh, say in Dundee and recharge a car, that's not practical. So the nature of the charging points has been improved to have an option between fast charging um, and, uh, uh, and the normal time, sometimes overnight uh, charging. So that's what we're investing in just now. And I think it's absolutely essential that we have the infrastructure there before we start to see what we expect we'll see, which is a large uptake in electric vehicles. Uh, but the ECOS partnership, which I mentioned before, is not just about that. It's about other things, for example, um, technological innovation. Scotland's a world leader in terms of the batteries. Uh, Dundee, uh, uh, we have companies here who are world leaders in terms of the batteries uh, for electric vehicles. And what we're trying to do through the ECOS partnership is make sure also that Scotland gets the economic benefit from being at the forefront of these things. For example, I recently saw a car um, which can be assembled anywhere, um, but it was developed in the Basque country that it can actually be assembled anywhere, which runs on the um, Scottish batteries. Um, so uh, that's the other aspect of uh, ECOS, not just that we encourage greater take-up, which we are doing, but we encourage the infrastructure to be improved. I recently opened one, for example, a, a charging point at um, Napier University, so you're seeing universities coming on board. Um, but also we try to make sure that Scotland gets at least its share, if not more, of the economic benefits from being at the forefront of the technology. Okay, and my last question is, how many electrical, electric vehicles are registered in Scotland and how many of these are in private ownership as opposed to be owned by public authority? And do you consider it likely that private electric vehicle ownership will increase due to an extent where it could make an impact in greenhouse gas emissions? I think to take the last point first, yes, we expect an increase. Um, it's also true to say that the technology moves quite quickly. So um, the cars which have been produced by uh, Renault, um, Toyota and others, they're improving. Um, and some of the earlier teething problems uh, are being addressed. So we do expect to see an increase. We don't expect that increase will happen until, or it won't substantially happen until we've made sure that the network is there of charging points, as I've mentioned. Um, and uh, as to the ownership, the private ownership of electric vehicles, is something we can only guess at. We wouldn't be notified of that. But what I can do is get the latest information on the stuff that we have for private ownership. Uh, and just to say one final part on uh, public, uh, public ownership or ownership by public authorities, um, South Lanarkshire Council has been very um, mm -hmm. good at uh, using electric vehicles. I've, I've driven one of them myself. And they've found huge benefits um, environmentally, also the noise, uh, of these vehicles. Um, so the more we can encourage people to do as South Lanarkshire have done, which is to replace substantial parts of their fleet with electric vehicles, then people get used to seeing them, probably used to not hearing them as well. There was one I'd driven up in, uh, I was in up in Shetland, and it was um, so quiet. The guy that was driving it said that he'd actually managed to come right up behind on this country road, this woman who was walking her dog, and neither the dog nor the woman had realised the car was right behind them. There's an issue there, I think, about safety as well. So um, the benefits are being realised by some of the private, uh, by the, some of the public sector, uh, and I think it will be the case that the public sector will, will lead on this. Mm -hmm. uh, but the latest information on ownership, we'll make sure we get that information to the committee, as well as the information on how many points we've currently got and how many we expect to have next year. Thank you. Adam, you want to ask a question on borders rail? Could we just come back to the last one? I think Archie's got some more information. I'll we'll just give some more information on the charging points the, and the vehicles. In terms of public sector vehicles, there's 230 
uh, EVs currently, which uh, uh, funded through previous schemes. Uh, we don't have such a strong track on the private ones because it's a private matter. Even where people get a grant, we only have to track that through vehicle registration, so that's quite a retrospective approach. But as Minister's committed, we'll get what information we have on that. In terms of the infrastructure, we, there's uh, around 300 points, of which about 80 are publicly available at the minute, but there's quite an extensive programme to develop these. And into spring next year, we hope to have 500 points a proportion, a good proportion of which will be publicly available. We don't have the exact figures because the negotiation is still going on with the local authorities. I should say that some of these points will be double-headed without getting into the details of it, so more than one car can charge, but let's just call it the, 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 mm -hmm. the locations. And people will access these through the National Charge Point Registry, and that's how they can access and book them. Right, thank you. Okay, just a quick question. I mentioned the cap on the M8 completion project. Um, is there a, a cap on the Borders Rail uh, project? Uh, I think it's at the moment it's um, uh, reputed to the budget's reputed to be two hundred ninety-four million pounds. Are we going to go? Uh, what happens if we go above that, or can we go above? That? I, I, the target, I think, it's 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 different from say a roads project. And as far as I think the borders rail, really, we're talking about the whole life costs because the way we're now procuring that project through Network Rail, who I think today have announced that they've awarded the contract to uh, Bam Nuttall, who will construct the railway. So it's really the whole life cost. Although uh, Ainsley will be able to come back on the actual construction cost, but the overall capital cost. Um, uh, over the whole life, the cost of bu building and maintaining the line as well, over 30 years, have come in around £60 million under budget. But as I announced previously, there's an increase in the construction cost, and perhaps Andrew can give more information on that. Uh, the £294 million that's agreed with Net Network Rail includes the cost of the contract with BAM, which is around £220 million. Uh, and provision uh, for risks, uh, given the continued uncertainties uh, due to mine workings along the route and, um, uh, and earthworks. And also, because the, the nature of the line that is crossing, it's an old it's existing line that's being reused, and there are a lot of um, old uh, structures where um, there's been quite a lot of investigation into what the state of those structures will be, but until the construction works go ahead, it, um, the, 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 the entire extent of the work required won't be known. So there's been a risk pot that's been allocated within that 294 um, um, million. Uh, there's also what we call a, a pay and gain mechanism that we've agreed with Network Rail. So there's an incentive on Network Rail to bring the cost in under um, the 294, uh, and if so, we will share 50-50 the, uh, the, the cost savings. Uh, on the downside, uh, we also there's a pain element, so if the costs go up, then we share the, those costs with, with, with Network Rail as well on a 50-50 basis. Thank you. Okay, if we move to Edinburgh Trams, Gordon. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, Minister, about the Edinburgh Tram project, which has uh, caused major disruption to the city for a long number of years. Uh, I mean, we've had good news recently with the, the opening of the uh, test track between Gogar and the airport. Um, but, however, given the history of the project where we saw <coughs> Um, back in 2003, uh, a budget of £375 million for a tram network, becoming in 2007 £545 million um, for a single tram line. And then last year's announcement, it was going to be £776 million. Uh, and also the timetable slippage from 2008 to summer 2011 to 2013 to summer 2014. Uh, my question is, what's your view on whether the delivery of the project remains within the revised budget and completion date announced last year? And what's the Scottish Government's involvement been in trying to get this project back on track? Uh, on the, the point about the completion date, um, yes, I think that will be met. The, completion, the new revised completion date, I think you're absolutely right to say because that this is a revised date because as soon as we start to say we'll do it on time, people realise this is massively behind schedule, yeah. this is massively over budget, 
Um, I, you'll know that uh, it's never been in the Scottish Government's position that uh, we thought this was the best way to spend what now turns out to be uh, more than three quarters of a billion pounds of public money. However, we did get to the situation of the delays and the cost overruns and uh, Scottish Government through Transport Scotland has been heavily involved for some time now, mainly through uh, Ainsley, who, who's here today. And I think that's been, along with a, a new approach from the Council and other partners, uh, a much more focused approach has been beneficial in making sure we can make progress with this. Because whatever your view of the trams in the first place, I've made clear what the Scottish Government's view was uh, of the tram project. Um, whatever your view of that, it was vitally important that we started to get real progress made on this mm -hmm. and get the job done. Uh, as you say, there have been uh, very good um, indications of progress being made that was much delayed for many years. We've had the testing of the track, as you say, between the Gail and, uh, and the airport. One of the crucial things, I think, which, uh, in, in my view, as well as others in the project, that the Scottish Government through Transport Scotland was able to help with was the issue of... Um, conflicts and utilities, um, you know, whereby people went in not knowing what was under the ground and then discovered somebody would dig it up and then another utility contract would come along and say, we've got to dig it up as well for our, our, our purposes. I think that has been hugely uh, advanced by the involvement of Transport Scotland and others. Um, and it's for that reason I think we do have increasing confidence that we will meet um, the deadline uh, that's been the revised uh, deadline and the revised budget. We are, we're increasingly confident of meeting those two. And the, the actual nature of the government's um, involvement now is that Ainsley sits uh, on the board and other officials are involved. Uh, the government has um, a has the ability to say, you know, if something has to happen, that we do that in conjunction with our partners. So I think there's been a, a real focusing and discipline brought to the project that wasn't evident in the past now. I don't know if you'd like the Ainsley to say it, because Ainsley is directly involved in this, to say a word or two about it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think the turning point was the mediation exercise um, back in March 2011, which ministers were instrumental in encouraging the parties to come together. <clears throat> that not only resolved the, the long-running disputes, the contractual disputes, but reset the, uh, the, the relationships between the, the key parties, particularly the contractor uh, and the council. Uh, and we've worked um, along with um, the, the new team in the council and the contractor in a much more collaborative way. Uh, and I think um, the, the results are visible to all the, who, 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 who um, you know, travel regularly into Edinburgh, although there are... The, the disruptions and um, uh, diversions, those are slowly starting to come off. Princess Street's now complete. Uh, works are well advanced in Shanmig Place and Sandwich Square. And the utilities that the Minister mentioned earlier, those have all been dealt with now. So the work is now largely on getting the, the track completed. Uh, we'll see the streets return to, to, to people there and to traffic. Uh, over the coming months, and then the focus will be on the uh, the electrical work, uh, stringing the cables, and then testing the trams. So, um, every indication that the, this is going to come in, uh, in, in uh, on uh, on time and on budget, uh, albeit revised budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay. If we move on to the EWPR uh, minister, which you mentioned in your. Uh, opening remarks. First of all, can I start by asking whether you're um, confident that absolutely all um, the legal challenges uh, are out of the way now? Yes, there, there, there is, I think, a theoretical possibility of a further legal challenge, but not one which could result in us not going ahead at this stage with the road. I think there possibly is. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, but um, all the legal challenges which we've had to go through have been, to my mind, uh, regrettable, have caused a huge delay, but there's no further legal challenge which will stop us getting on with this project. So what do I say to the few people who are still emailing me on, the, on this to try and stop it? Hey, <laughs> uh, they have no chance. <laughs> Get over it. <laughs> um, so um, can you provide then a timetable for the procurement and construction um, of the AWPR? Um, okay, uh, we mentioned earlier on the industry day that we'd had for the uh, M8 project. <coughs> so the industry day for uh, the AWPR will be in early 2013. I think it's worth saying we've already, within two days of the judgment, we proceeded with the um, tender for the uh, advanced works. I think it was the, the, the vegetation 
Uh, it's worth explaining there's some things that we couldn't do while that process was ongoing because it may have been deemed to have been in contempt of court. So what we're very conscious of doing was progressing with everything that we could and being ready to go as soon as the judgment was made if it was in our favour uh, afterwards. So within two days to move on that, and we've since seen the ground investigation works uh, pro progressing. Again, just to, to be clear on that, we had ground investigation works were substantially done, but there were areas that we couldn't go into because of the, the, the legal situation which we've now gone into. We've also announced the archaeological aspect of the dig that will be going on as well. So early 2013, the industry day with those that are in, interested in bidding for the, the, the project. At that time, around about the same time as well, we'll publish in the OJU, the official journal of the European Union, the contract notice. Again, in the spring, we'll issue the invitation to tender. Uh, in the autumn of 2014, we'll award the contract and commence the works with uh, completion uh, due in spring 2018. Okay, and um, you, um, in an answer to a question of mine, uh, said you would have community benefit clauses in it. And um, have you taken forward any work to maximise the opportunities for the employment um, and training of um, apprentices, uh, long-term unemployed, um, university graduates in civil engineering and also have you looked at the possibilities of um, improving the environment at the same time in terms of um, using stone that's already been um, is, that is lying about in vast quantities around the route yeah, both uh, things as you say community you've mentioned previously yes we are taking forward a community benefit clause as, as you suggested previously I'll, I'll maybe ask Ainsley to come in the detail of that but it's not just about the apprenticeship and training opportunities but we also want to have um, the portal which uh, is used uh, in the fourth road um, uh, crossing project whereby local businesses can access uh, those projects as well so local community will benefit from getting as best access as we can possibly deliver in terms of the subcontracts and procurement that lies underneath the main contract, uh, as well as, um, as you say, the employment uh, benefits. But on not that issue and also on the issue of reuse of uh, on-site um, materials, perhaps, so you can give more detail. Yeah. <coughs> in terms of community benefits, we'll be building on our experience of M74, where we had, uh, on a voluntary basis, with the contractor uh, quite successful um, uh, apprentice uh, 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 training scheme which took I think 10 apprentices through um, uh, that pr the life of that project it was a four year project so it gives um, a good opportunity to, to train um, uh, young people and apprentices. Um, we now uh, as the Minister has, has mentioned have uh, community benefits clauses within fourth and we'll be using exactly the same uh, uh, mechanisms as we have in fourth on, on Aberdeen Western Peripheral. And just to give an example of the benefits that the fourth uh, clauses or fourth uh, provisions are, are providing, um, <clears throat> the, we expect them to deliver a, an average of 45 uh, vocational training um, positions a, a year, uh, in, including 46 positions for the long-term unemployed. Now, we don't have the exact numbers for Aberdeen, but these are the kind of uh, benefits that can be built into these projects. In terms of uh, reuse of materials, um, the design of the, the road has been very much focused on um, balancing, wherever possible, uh, what we call the cut and fill, so where we're digging material and rock out, uh, to take the road through cutting. We use as much of that material uh, on the project itself um, in the embankments that we require to go over uh, railways, roads and, 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 the, and the river crossings. Um, uh, and that minimises the need to bring material, new material in from other, other places and also minimises the need to dispose of material. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, good for the environment and, it, um, uh, uh, and its economical use of the materials on site. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the um, employment and training and apprenticeship um, possibilities, um, I think, uh, for example, Construction Skills Organisation thinks that perhaps um, the requirement of contractors is not robust enough and there's, they've got a kind of um, template of, of how many apprentices should be or can be employed on, on specific um, 
project. So are you working with organisations like Construction Skills to see just exactly how many apprentices can be uh, trained on, on a project like this? I think the um, I'll find it exactly from Ainsley. I think we did originally when the, this, the the concept was first taken forward have those discussions not just with construction <coughs> skills from memory but from uh, wider stakeholders as well. But um, it is the case there is a balance to be struck, obviously, from getting the best uh, price for the contract and maximising these opportunities. So from my point of view, I'd have no problem at all in a further discussion with construction skills prior to. In the final details of the AWPR uh, contract, but Ainsley might know what discussions have happened so far. Uh, there have been a, a, um, extensive uh, discussions in the past year or two with a number of organisations and bodies um, um, uh, in trying to design um, a fit for purpose um, uh, uh, provision within our contracts that allow uh, training places long term uh, and uh, opportunities for long term unemployed, including discussions with the contracting industry themselves through through SECA. Uh, but as the minister says, we we, we are happy to have uh, can, you know continue that dialogue. Okay, and in terms of um, you know thinking about what you said about um, using uh, hard uh, stuff along the route. Um, I suppose I'm saying is, are you prepared to look at the stones that are lying about the route rather than quarrying new stone to, yeah, to use the hard I mean, there's a, an economic advantage and imperative for the contractor because they not only have to pay for that material, um, but they also have to pay um, um, the uh, aggregate tax. So um, mm -hmm. uh, there's every incentive within this contract for the contractors to, to, to make the best use of all available material within the land that we give we make available for them to, to, to build the road. Okay, Margaret, <coughs> did you oh yeah. Margaret and yeah. Alex <coughs> Yeah. Um couple of questions here about the sort of procurement process as well. Um you'd mentioned that you will be encouraging SMEs or micro businesses to actually put forward in the tendering process. My experience has been that this is the group that's furthest away from actually being successful in actually obtaining tender uh, work. And it's due to a number of things. One, the process is so time consuming and complicated that these businesses don't have the skills or the staff or the expertise to actually complete a successful tender. So what, are you, what is the government actually going to do when you say you're actually going to encourage this group to actually bid for it? OK, we want them to bid, but we also want them to be successful as well. And also within the tendering process, um, is there going to be some kind of commitment from the larger organisations that actually may subcontract to the smaller SMEs and micro-businesses that they have got a commitment to actually pay the invoice is sent and submitted by these organisations within a really tight time uh, line because obviously <laughs> cash flow is really, really important to these businesses. Uh, yes, and that last point I think has been a, a long-standing issue in the construction industry, the, the question of being paid on time for, for work completed. Um, can I say, first of all, on, on making sure we make it as easy as possible for small and medium enterprises to access uh, the business, whether it's subcontracts or procurement. Um, what I mentioned before was the portal that we have, and it's worked very successfully in the fourth road crossing. If you look at the numbers uh, of but small businesses, uh, local businesses, which have benefited from that, uh, it just makes it, it, having the one place where all these contracts will be, they'll know from day one where future contracts under the main contract, uh, where the business can be bid for, where it's going to be notified. So they'll know that any business mm -hmm. will be. And uh, in relation to the fourth road crossing, we had awareness days with local chambers of commerce to make sure that all their members were aware of that as well. Um, so we have to make it as, as widely known as possible and as simple as possible. I understand mm -hmm. the point that you're making as well. Um, I, I think it is an issue when we have these very large scale contracts that you inevitably uh, attract people from overseas and other countries. Uh, now there are benefits and there are downsides to that. Um, uh, the benefits, of course, you can get extremely keen prices. Uh, and the disbenefits are that uh, you might not get as much out of the contract than you would have done for the economy generally had it been let by uh, local companies. That is one of the aims, I think, of the procurement bill, which I'm not responsible for, but I, think, I understand that what, what has been sought there is the ability to award, on a contract, award a contract based on the overall economic impact of that contract rather than just a straightforward price. 
Um, and there are legal constraints on what we can do, what we can write into a contract. It can be challenged or, worst of all, people are not interested because it's so restrictive. But within that, perhaps, again, if, if, if Ainsley can be, if you just mentioned what we're doing in terms of making sure that businesses can be involved, and also the point about payment on time. Yeah. <coughs> uh, as the Minister said, um, um, we'll be extending the use of the uh, Public Contracts Scotland portal uh, that we made mandatory uh, on um, the... Um, the, the fourth, um, that's been hugely successful, but as well as uh, opening up these opportunities and making them more invisible to small uh, companies, we've also been working alongside the um, enterprise companies, the local enterprise companies, to make sure that they're aware um, of these opportunities coming up and, and can provide the necessary support to, to, to those smaller businesses to access these markets and whatever. Uh, arrangements they, they need to put in place to help them with the, with tendering. Uh, so that has been successful and we'll continue to to to, to use that on, on, on Aberdeen and, and MA where we'll naturally see the larger contractors being the uh, or the larger organisations being the main contracting bodies. Uh, in terms of payment we um, uh, operate a very strict uh, um, uh, regime of paying the contractors invoice, the main contractors invoices within uh, 10 days. Uh, we require the contractor to um, similarly um, pay their subcontractors within 28 days. We have um, uh, um, we have limited uh, ability to um, um, uh, legislate for that, but. Our, our experiences that we've on, on a number of major jobs over the last five or six years is we've had no complaints from the subcontracting industry that they're not being paid in, on a timely basis. And certainly we encourage all our contractors to treat uh, the subcontractors and suppliers indeed on, on a similar basis as we treat them. Okay. Um, but just another couple of questions. The, the <coughs> the individuals that will actually be looking at the tenders for this work, will they be occupationally competent and understand the the, the background, the, you know, everything to do with the construction sort of work, so they can understand what people are actually putting in the tender, so they can understand the whole process as well and make probably, a good judgment? It's probably better for me to answer that mm -hmm. than Ainsley, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think uh, the track record of the people, uh, not least Ainsley, but others that work with them uh, on this is, is mm -hmm. tremendous. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the M74, the M90, the fourth crossing, um, there's been a, a, a huge amount of expertise built up and I think a very positive track record. I know it's not um, sometimes the, the things which make the headlines, but they've been hugely uh, successful in doing this. So I, for my part, uh, have got a great deal of confidence in the officials that will look at this that they know, mm -hmm. especially on roads construction, extremely good uh, body of expertise and some very competent officials. And just to very to quickly divert back to the previous discussion on trams, and I know it's not the purpose of the committee to do any <coughs> kind of uh, backslapping, but I think that the, the efforts of the officials, who are by and large the same officials that will deal with the point that you're making uh, in relation to bringing the, the rigour and discipline to the trams project along with other stakeholders has made a fantastic difference. So I, I have every confidence that the officials, mm -hmm. which will be headed by um, Ainsley but mm -hmm. others as well, is, is very good in dealing with this kind of uh, project. My last, my last question is um, with regard to the Barnet Consequential that you've actually received £394 billion, pounds, will you be using that in any of your shovel-ready projects that you've actually mentioned before? And can you actually tell us what your shovel-ready projects are? Yeah, it's 394 million rather than billion, but it's also not that much because around 60 million of that will come off in terms of other budgets being top sliced. So I think you're talking about 338 million pounds. Uh, and we have published a list of um, uh, shovel-ready projects. I'm happy to provide mm -hmm. that to the committee if you, if, if you need if you need that. Yeah, uh, what will happen, though, as a result of this, you're quite right, is that mm -hmm. that new money will allow us to look at different things. Now, uh, it's not uh, my decision. I'll, I'll be making my pitch for the, my area in terms of transport, um, but it'll be the decision of, of the Cabinet, and the Cabinet Secretary as well will be very prominent in that, John Swinney. Um, so I can't publish in advance because I don't, I don't know what the outcome of that will be. 
but certainly we can provide the committee with our existing list of shovel ready projects. Lovely, thank you. Can okay, I just mention one thing on that because it does, yeah. doesn't get any attention, otherwise convenient mm -hmm. if I can, on roads maintenance. One of the items in that... I was that, just going uh, to ask about road maintenance, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just coming on to a question on okay. road maintenance in a minute. Alex, you had a question on AWPR. Very briefly, the convener quite rightly asked in relation to the AWPR about uh, the opportunities for employment and training of local people. Unusually in the North East, we, unfor we fortunately have very low levels of unemployment and consequently uh, these training opportunities might not be filled. What can the government do to ensure that people from other parts of Scotland are able to access the opportunities that the AWPR may provide? Uh, well, I think it comes back to the point about skills and training, because in the North East, as you rightly say, low levels of unemployment, but many of the employers are starting to identify some skills gaps. So I think mm -hmm. we have to try and do this in a joined up kind of way, whereby we can help and we have um, labour around the country that will be interested in those opportunities. But our responsibility is obviously to make sure that that labour is uh, as trained as, and as skilled as possible, mm -hmm. and it's up to us to make sure we provide those opportunities, some of which will be uh, directly provided through the apprenticeships, for example, but elsewhere in the country to make sure that we have the construction skills um, in the workforce that inevitably these days is much more mobile and want to travel to. Just as many people from Scotland for the last 40 years have travelled to the North East to take up the opportunities in the oil industry, again, because of this very substantial uh, construction project, not the only one in Scotland, we want to make sure that people can uh, take up those opportunities by making sure they're as well trained as possible. Okay, we move on to road ma maintenance, and you can see what you wanted to say under this uh, um, heading. But uh, can you provide an update on the implementation of the results of the National Road Maintenance Review, particularly highlighting what impact this has had on improving the state of Scotland's roads? Uh, yes, well, as I've mentioned before, there were the 30 recommendations, and the first meeting uh, has taken place of the, of the group which was established, so it's co-chaired by myself. Uh, and by a COSLA representative who in this case I think is, um, is uh, from the Northern Isles. And a key to that was the idea of joint working. I should just say that in case I forget the point I was going to make uh, previously, can you, if I can, that uh, the Shovel Ready projects which you mentioned, which have been published, included uh, an allocation of around £35 million for roads maintenance. <coughs> I mention that because it's often something that's uh, ignored because it's not a new project or a new road or a new uh, piece of the railway network, um, but vitally important and also good for employment as well. And it does tend to be parceled into smaller chunks which smaller local businesses can access. So uh, we are well aware of the, the um, backlog in terms of work that has to be done on our roads and also the extent to which that can be exacerbated during a tough uh, winter period. So uh, the final report, as I say, set out the 30 options. Recently, we've had the conclusion of the review. We've had the strategic, uh, strategic action group, which, as I say, I lead with uh, Stephen Hagen. It is from COSLA. Met on the 15th of November. Um, it's, the review itself has identified that strategic framework for change which will embed best practice. Uh, the 30 evidence-based initiatives, which are mentioned, will deliver up to, we believe, 10% in savings. Uh, it's also recommended a central resource is established to encourage councils to design and deliver a package of shared services initiatives. And that's, that's an area perhaps where the biggest progress uh, can be made. Um, it is the case, or it can be the case, that a council can be doing uh, road works um, uh, and even lighting works on the road network right up to a boundary with either a trunk road or another council's road. For example, and we believe that those things done in a more joined up way can be delivered um, more efficiently and also with less use of public resources. So those initiatives have been taken forward. We've had the first meeting, as I say, on the 15th of November, uh, and it's now up to not just ourselves, but the 33, as it will be, uh, local um, partners, the roads authorities, and that will include, uh, provided the bill goes through Parliament, uh, the new uh, the new fourth, uh, fourth crossings um, uh, body as well. It's up for them to take that forward, but the work is ongoing. Okay, um, and last week we had um, Mobil Mobility and Access Committee for Scotland, Max in and uh, Passengers Use Scotland, and they had some issues that they raised with us that we said we would raise with you. So, Jim, you're going to take those forward. Okay, um, I'll try and be as brief as possible. Um, Minister, the, there's currently a review by your officials of Passengers Use Scotland. It would be useful for the committee to have an update on what stage that review is at. One of the other issues 
um, which PVS raised with the committee was the fact that their good practice guide for Scottish bus operators had not been adopted um, by the UK Confederation of Passenger Transport and therefore we were interested to know they were interested to know and we would be interested to know what discussions there have been between your officials and yourself and the counterparts in the UK uh, ministry on that subject. And then finally, in terms of PVS's concerns, they raised the issue of the integration of rail and bus um, services where these were both operated by a single company. Is that an issue that um, you are aware of and what would your response be to that? to the concerns about that, given the, the, the competition legislation that, that, is, uh, that applies to that? Well, the, the way, just on the last point, uh, first if I can, uh, the way that we are looking to address that is to step away from the point of whether bus and rail are delivered by the same um, provider, because there are issues of us doing that, either being harsher on that kind of arrangement or being uh, more willing to accommodate it. So the way we are, we are looking to address that is in the next franchise, and this will be the first time we've had the new franchise, is to make it an obligation on whoever comes forward for that franchise, an, an obligation written into the franchise, that they have to start to integrate uh, bus and rail, so, and also ferry. So the idea that um, buses arrive before trains depart it sounds a very simple thing, but um, th those things are, there's an obligation on the rail franchise holder um, to make sure that they arrange things in that way. So it is the case, as you will know, that sometimes that will be the same provider, depending on who wins the contract, but some of the biggest companies uh, are the ones which provide um, bus as well as, as rail. So, but we can't really set a franchise which accommodates one or the other. We just have to state our um, desire that this will be integrated in the future in a way that's not been in the past. So that's how we're trying to deal with it. Uh, if there are issues of... Um, a regulation, then by and large, those are, as you mentioned uh, in relation to the same provider, there are not issues by and large which we have the remedies currently to resolve. It's Office of Fair Trading or it's Competition Commission, so we don't have the wherewithal to, de to deal with that just now. There have been investigations by, for example, the Competition Commission in relation to bus, parts of the bus industry in Scotland, but they they, they promote that and uh, we can refer things on to them, but that's dealt with at the UK level currently. Um, on the point uh, about uh, PBS, we were very close to coming to a conclusion. Um, I know that they expressed an interest in seeing that brought to a conclusion. There have been some issues to work through in terms of, of how these things could be better um, better arranged. That's taken us some time to work through, and it's taken longer than perhaps expected. But we're well aware of the both the fact that there have been the resignations uh, from PVS and the uh, diminishing board that's there, and the need to reappoint um, uh, that they've they've mentioned. So uh, we're well aware of that. We're coming to a conclusion very shortly on it. Yeah, on? That's fine. And the um, it'd be interesting to know what what your definition of very shortly is, but that. That's a helpful um, response. The other point was about the good practice guide for bus operators that had not been adopted by the UK uh, Confederation of Passenger Transport. And had you raised that issue um, either directly or through officials with your counterparts south of the border? I, no, I think on the issues and the relationship with CPT, we have our own relationship with the Scottish um, organisation of CPT. In fact, with discussions going on at this very minute with CPT. Um, on some very big issues for the bus industry. So uh, we have that um, direct dialogue, so anything else would be uh, over and above that. Maybe get um, Archie to come in and listen to that. Just to go back to your point about uh, timescales and be more specific, uh, certainly within the next um, four to six weeks, maybe not even as long as that, before we come to decision on that. But perhaps Archie could come in on the relationship with the UK bus organisation. Certainly CPT view the guide as a fine so far as it goes but they don't they, they haven't seen a reason to attempt to have it extended to UK wide we've contacted CPT have confirmed they're going to get in touch with the PBS to discuss the position further so that will move that on so does that mean that you have been in dialogue with your uh, we have been in contact officials, uh, officials have been in contact with the CPT about that position and they're going to get in touch with us say with PBS to discuss that their position further okay. I've got a couple of final questions that the the um, organisations had asked us to raise with you and they were in relation to the, the blue badge eligibility mm -hmm. and the welfare reform changes which means that um, 
people currently eligible may no longer be eligible for a blue badge. Um, is that something that the government is addressing? Yes. Uh, is uh, able to address? And I might as well just give you the, the, the mm -hmm. final question, which was the, the real 2014 consultation um, for particular issues around the passenger experience in relation to disability access to trains and stations. Is that an issue that you're addressing? Yes, uh, on the first issue of the blue badge uh, reform, we are very actively involved in this. In fact, not least with Max themselves, who've got a great deal of expertise within the membership in relation to this. Um, and there is a uh, business which will come before the Parliament in relation to that, how uh, we further refine the blue badge uh, scheme. A lot of changes have taken place already with the support of uh, stakeholders, for example, the improved enforcement. The passporting, though, of um, uh, current uh, provisions uh, under uh, welfare provisions, which are UK-led, um, does present us with challenges. And what we're keen to do is to make sure that we don't have anybody falling through the cracks in relation to that that should otherwise be able to get um, a blue badge with as little um, uh, hassle as possible. Uh, I mean, that does have to be balanced on the other side with making sure we drive abuse out of the system. But uh, our, our efforts just now, I'm working with Max, is trying to make sure that we can do this as painlessly as possible. Obviously, it's not a change which we've sought. It's der derived from changes to, to the welfare, the, the welfare reform changes from the UK government. It does present us with some challenges, but I think we're making pretty good progress. And again, I think fairly shortly we should be able to come to a conclusion on that. Well, and the real 2014 consultation? Yes, uh, your point was about access and, and disability um, access. And disability access. I mean, the main purpose for, or the main vehicle through which we um, do that just now is through the Awards for All programme. But maybe Aidan would know um, some other aspects to it as well. But that, that allows us to tap into what is again currently a UK uh, led initiative, although um, this is where money is provided to provide improvements to um, stations, whether it's ramps or um, lifts and so on, at uh, different railway stations. We recommend to the UK government, to the Department of Transport, what we think are the pre most pressing cases, and uh, they take the decision on that still. Uh, but again, uh, we've also announced £30 million already, um, a pot of £30 million under the next franchise for station improvements. Now, that doesn't necessarily just mean for access, but it can mean that. And it doesn't necessarily mean new stations. It does mean um, existing stations can access that money to improve their uh, disability uh, access for people with disabilities, including people uh, who are visually impaired as well. So those are the main vehicles through which we will improve it. Of course, it's a big rail network. It's largely Victorian, um, but uh, there's a lot of work to be done. But for example, if you go to, in your own area, into Waverley, as I was last night, um, fantastic improvements taking place there. Um, so there's, there's various ways in which we can address this, and we're well aware of that. And I think we've made provision for that already. Um, obviously, the franchise specification's not drawn up, but we've specified that point already about the improvement uh, stations fund. Thank you. Spot point, Alex. <laughs> I'll get into trouble when she hears what I'm going to talk about as well. The, in last week's autumn statement, the Chancellor uh, further reiterated the intention to complete the upgrade to motorway of the A1 to Newcastle. Uh, and previously, the government had uh, increased the level of priority given to the A1 north of Newcastle towards Berwick. Could I, that holds out the prospect of a, the development of a, an East Coast motorway network, which could have huge economic benefits for Scotland. Where does the continued upgrade of the A1 uh, between Edinburgh and Berwick lie within the government's priorities? I think we made that clear in the, in the STPR. I, I do think you're right to say that this announcement from the UK government uh, is something we have to look at to see uh, what, if anything, that changes. But um, uh, we have made clear what our priorities are through the STPR previously. I don't know if you want to say anything specifically on the one about the improvements we've made already, Ainsley, but um, I think we need to have a bit of time to look exactly what uh, and when the UK government's going to carry out these improvements. But I don't know if you want to mention what we're doing just now. Uh, well, there are, no <clears throat> there are no active plans for further improvements along the, um, in terms of um, upgrading to dual. Uh, beyond what's already been completed. The main link into, uh, 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 motorway link into Scotland uh, remains the M74, but clearly, as the Minister says, um, th that would have to be looked at again in light of what um, uh, um, uh, the announcement made by the, by the UK government. 
Road this side is very much better than <laughs> when you get to Berwick and south to Newcastle. Anyway, I think that's all the questions. That's been a long uh, session, Minister. Can I thank you and your officials uh, for your attendance? Uh, the committee will be looking at the ferries plan uh, on our first meeting back in January. So when you publish it, it looks like it's going to be our uh, Christmas reading. But can I suspend the meeting for uh, allow a change of your, of your witnesses, Minister? Okay, if we can start again and move on to agenda item three, the Marine Navigation Number Two Bill. Um, 
this is consideration of LCM of an LCM on the Marine Navigation Number Two Bill. Uh, can I thank you, Minister, for staying on to give evidence to the committee on this matter? And I welcome your supporting officials, Valg Ferguson from the Policy Executive, and Stuart Forbester, Divisional Solicitor. Um, before I invite members to begin questioning, can I remind the committee that we have a very short window in which to consider and agree a report on the LCM. The LCM must be taken by the Scottish Parliament before the Christmas recess. Uh, we will therefore consider our draft report later on in this meeting. Minister, would you like to make some opening remarks on this? Yes, I'll be brief, uh, Kavina, thank you. The proposed uh, LCM on the devolved provisions of the Marine Navigation No. 2 Bill would, uh, in my view, offer benefits to the operation of Scottish harbours without the need to develop separate legislation. The main provisions and those most relevant to Scotland include amendments to the Harbours Act 1964 and the Pilotage Act 1987. Both are UK-wide acts applying to Scotland. The Harbours Act amends, uh, amendments include provision for orders to be made to permit or to direct harbour authorities to cease to maintain harbours that are no longer commercially viable or necessary. And they also include powers for Scottish ministers to designate harbours which may give directions in respect of ships in entering or leaving their harbour. The Pilotage Act amendments include provision for Scottish ministers to designate by order that a harbour authority is no longer a competent harbour authority, thereby removing its pilotage functions where these are no longer necessary. And in addition, it amends the provisions for pilotage exemption certificates to be applied for by any deck officer rather than only the master and first uh, mate of any vessel, subject to the current competence testing by the competent authority. The bill has the broad support of the ports industry and we'd wish to see it apply to Scotland to ensure that the powers available to our ports should the need uh, arise to use them. Uh, although I would add that the closure of harbours and the removal of pilotage functions are not scenarios we expect to see arise except on an exceptional basis. And ministers wouldn't be expecting to use these two powers on a proactive basis. It would be for the harbours in question to provide a detailed case to accompany any such application. So that's a brief overview of the main provisions and happy to try and answer any questions the committee may have. Okay, I think we've got three questions which uh, I'm just going to put to you, Minister. But first of all, um, uh, are there, have you identified any harbours that um, no longer need to be maintained in Scotland? You, you said that it covered that. No. No, okay. not. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the ben benefits that uh, this LCM would bring to Scotland, um, can you outline, you know, specifically or uh, with specific examples, what benefits it might bring? Uh, well, th those which I think uh, I've mentioned in the opening statement, but it also contributes, I think, generally to safer harbour operations uh, by Scottish ports. It allows them the direction powers, um, the harbour authorities, to allow them to safely regulate the harbour. It takes away some of the burdens from harbour authorities which no longer need or use pilotage powers or oversee harbour. So. It, if you like, it tidies up that uh, process. And I think the LCM itself uh, does contain useful provisions at a UK level which could be adopted um, very straightforwardly in Scotland. And also the fact that we don't have um, opposition from the, the ports and harbours themselves are very supportive of this. So the main, the main benefits are to make our harbours uh, safer, though. Um, <clears throat> you state that um, the issues addressed in the bill wouldn't merit separate Scottish legislation um, can you explain this view and is it something that you, you wouldn't have done as a Scottish government if you had the competency? Uh, well, I think it is something that we would have done if we'd had uh, the competency or if, if we had um, the need to do it, you know, if, if the Parliament had the powers, I'm sure we would have taken these uh, forward already. But uh, I think it's a question of whether we should uh, put the um, resources and the time, Parliament's time involved into bringing forward separate legislation for this when we do have a proposal from the UK government which enjoys the support of the industry and can be easily uh, taken forward under this circumstance. So that's the main benefit. I think also the ports and harbours um, industry, which I know you, you know yourself very well, convener, are quite see, keen to see the governments collaborate on interests, on their interests. And in this case, it both makes uh, harbours uh, safer and it takes away some bureaucracy. So I think it's broadly welcomed. So it seems to us a sensible way forward. So uh, on that point, then, <coughs> are there differences between those privately owned ports and those that are trust ports? Um, you know, will, will there be any differences uh, in how it affects ports 
if they're trust ports or, or private ports? No, the same provisions will apply right. to both. Okay. Um, the subordinate legislation obviously uh, considered um, this LCM um, and Clause 13 of the Bill gives Scottish Ministers the powers to commence Sections 1 to 6 in relation to Scotland and the sub Committee has asked this, this committee to explore further the points it raised with officials last week on the powers contained in Clause 13 to make incidental provision within the commencement provisions. Officials have suggested that although the Scottish Government could have asked for the incidental power, provision power to be removed, um, this was not considered necessary as it's unlikely to be used. Can you explain why this view was taken and would it not have been preferable to have asked for the Bill to reflect Scottish Minister's intentions on this matter? I think, as you say, Convener, that was discussed uh, with officials and perhaps Stuart could... Uh, um, the feeling was that it, it is a very minor matter. The bill includes the power to um, make incidental provision in the context of making a commencement order. That's not a power we normally take in the Scottish Parliament. But it, it is terribly minor. It is unlikely to be used. And we simply didn't think that there was any particular need to go to the extent of um, amending the Westminster Bill to disapply it to Scotland. Okay, does anybody else have any questions? Okay, can I thank you for your attendance and we'll consider a report to Parliament later on in this meeting. Thank you. Our third item of business is consideration of two public petitions. Firstly, we will consider petition PE1236, which is from Jill Fotheringham and relates to safety improvements for the A90 and A9937. Members have a paper from the clerk which sets out the background to the petition. The Public Petitions Committee considered the petition on the 27th of November and agreed to refer it to this committee for further consideration. On looking at this issue, the committee should note that responsibility for any work carried out on the issues raised by the petition lies at local level and that the relevant local authority and transport bodies are engaged with the issues raised. raised. So can I invite comments from members? Oh, wait a minute. Alec first. Uh, I was going to jump in first, convener, because I think I was actually the first politician to sign uh, Joel Fotheringham's petition uh, many years ago which was a as a result of one of a number of fatal accidents that happened at this junction. The first achievement of the campaign was that uh, a previous transport minister some years ago uh, put uh, a, what was believed to be a temporary speed limit on the A90 uh, at the junction and speed cameras were erected. Since then there have been no fatalities but there continue to be accidents uh, and uh, given that this is uh, a busy junction on the the A90, that uh, the A937 is a, a key junction that uh, deals with traffic coming from the Montrose area, both commuter traffic and heavy lorries related to the oil industry going north, the inadequacy of this junction is obvious. It's been subject to a petition for some time, and uh, I found myself regularly visiting the Petitions Committee to support this uh, petition. Uh, and it's an extreme disappointment to me that it has been on the agenda of committees uh, and of others for so long, and yet no progress has been made. What I would emphasise is that the measures that were taken were always uh, on to improve safety on the road were always assumed to be temporary, and now they very much seem to have become permanent. So, what are you suggesting? <laughs> I was going to allow other people to have their comments before I made a suggestion. Okay, well, Margaret. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of looked at this as well and did some sort of research into it as well. And I was going to say very similar to Alec. Um, although, what I would like to see, if it's possible, is to actually call some of these um, people that are involved in the, the writing of the letters and the petition to actually come to the Parliament and give us some evidence and give us more information about it. 
Could I suggest that we get the MSP and the petitioner to come along here as evidence? Because, I mean, I, I, I've used part of that road in the past, and I know that further south there has been new road junctions put in, and I just don't understand why this one hasn't been done, so it might be better to hear from the MSP and and the petitioners about that, about the situation. Is there a number of MSPs that's involved in that area? Um, or local be... businesses or other groups, maybe? I wouldn't be against that suggestion in principle, but I'm just wondering whether, in the first instance, the, the petitioners should give evidence to the Public Petitions Committee before coming to this oh, committee. Yeah. Has, been done has been done many done. times before, before this re referral took place. Yes, yeah, so should we not be trying to take it? Beyond having another witness session on this, is there not something more um, uh, that we can, by way of taking this matter forward, as opposed to just hearing the arguments again? Well, well we haven't heard the arguments, so it would be useful for us to actually hear it as well. We should have all the background mm -hmm. material from the other, the other uh, committee's consideration of it. I certainly know, as a current member of the Petitions Committee, this was... Uh, when it was passed on here, uh, it was bit, there was frustration being expressed uh, from the petitions committee that this had been such a long-running mm -hmm. issue that uh, really wasn't being progressed appropriately. Mm -hmm. uh, and th they wanted us uh, uh, to take that forward. So I don't know if you've got any uh, suggestions, given your, your, your long-running involvement in this, Alec. Well, option, just before you come in, Alec, options that I've got here are uh, writing to Transport Scotland seeking an update on the issues raised by the petition in the latest correspondence and on the discussions with Nest Trans. And this letter could also request information on the processes and uh, involved in assessing and acting upon safety issues at road junctions more generally together with details of where responsibility for making decisions on such matters lies. And we could write to Angus Council on what is being done to discourage the use of the A937 and hence reduce traffic at the Lawrence Kirk Junction between the A90 and the A937. I mean, I'm personally surprised that people don't use the the coast road more. But uh, the the issue with the coast road, <coughs> particularly in relation to heavy traffic, is that the bridge over the North Esk uh, on the the A92 North from Montrose is unfit for heavy traffic. And the, the issue here in terms of um, heavy goods vehicles is that Montrose is the, the southernmost town that is heavily involved in fabrication work related to the North Sea oil and gas industry. There are a number of companies uh, at Montrose who are transporting unusually wide or heavy loads. And as a consequence, the, the road network in that area is under pressure. Uh, at the moment, there is an effort to encourage uh, that traffic to use the road to Brechin and to use the junction uh, at Brechin to access the A90. But given that most of that traffic is travelling northward, that's a, quite a long way out of their way to go. And there are uh, also problems in relation to the road through Brechin itself to access that junction. So as a result, the, there is a tendency for all traffic uh, especially from the, the north end of Montrose, where there's a substantial commute, uh, commuter population that work in Aberdeen and work to the north, use that road naturally as their access point to the A90. Uh, and with the result that uh, it has become a pinch point in the network, with uh, heavy lorries crossing the southbound carriageway in order to turn north, uh, with substantial queues of traffic, uh, forming, uh, especially in the morning, trying to turn north across the southbound carriageway. And those who are aware of the local circumstances will know that there is a, a particularly wide central reservation there uh, with a problem of cars crossing the southbound <coughs> carriageway and queuing in the middle of the road uh, in order to turn north. The, while uh, there is uh, the option, uh, I'm sure, of uh, the Angus Council taking the, the opportunity to encourage traffic to take other routes, in practice, people will use that road because it is the main road north out of Montrose to the A90. Uh, and I don't think there's much you can do uh, to encourage people to travel virtually southward but to join the road and then travel north on the A90. Yeah, that's certainly the case for heavy goods vehicles because the, the bridge at the North Esk is 
you can't get round it basically if you're a big mm. vehicle, but that's not all traffic, is it? Uh, my own experience uh, of that road is that, uh, particularly at busy times, uh, it is not an attractive route for commuters to take. Uh, they've there was, I had experience of a recent uh, closure on the A90 when the traffic was diverted down there and when traffic levels reach uh, a certain point, uh, traffic just uh, comes to a standstill at many points on that road. The decision to detrunk that road meant uh, some years ago was um, a decision that it was not, uh, in my view, was a demonstration that it was not a suitable road for development and consequently the A90 was made the main trunk road. So I think all of those who are involved in uh, considering access to that road must take into account that that decision was made previously and the A90 is the main trunk road north. It's the only trunk road north at that point and access to it should remain a priority in my view. So what's your suggestion on it? Is it the same as these others? Uh, ultimately, uh, uh, my solution to the, ro the problem suggestion is a great separated take, junction. Suggestion <laughs> of how we take this forward. Uh, I think your suggestion that we write in the first instance to Transport Scotland uh, and get an updated position would be the appropriate way forward. And that we consider that reply when it comes back. Sure. Um, you do that in the first instance? In the no? first instance, yeah. Uh, it just strikes me the fact that uh, Transport Scotland are saying yes, we're, we're, they need a great separated junction, but no, we're not going to prioritise it. We're going to wait for a, a local housing development to come up with the, the cash to, to provide the we ever thought to, to do. The, the, the issue relating to local housing developments, uh, there is the, there are two junctions uh, to access Lawrence Kirk. And the north junction uh, is essentially a local road that has, uh, it's not a crossroad. And there is a reasonable uh, argument to be said that those who are investing in housing development in the area <coughs> contribute towards the improvement of that junction. The junction with the A90 and the A937 uh, is a junction between two A-class roads. Uh, it doesn't have a direct relationship to any housing development in the Lawrence Kirk area. It may be argued that it has a relationship to housing development in the Montrose and Hillside area, but which are in a different local government area. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a consequence, there is uh, an element uh, in this, in that responsibility for this junction is not claimed by either local authority. Uh, and consequently it has been systematically ignored. <coughs> and I think the idea that we might get local development to finance this is probably impractical. Yeah. I think that's a good point, yeah. though. And I think if, when we're writing to Transport Scotland, we should ask specific information about <coughs> the processes um, and how they, they, they act on safety issues at junctions and where the responsibility lies in terms of, you know, somebody collectively looking at how much housing has gone in that's affected, mm -hmm. uh, affects this junction, um, because you're right. I mean, if you look at Hillside, for example, has there been more development there than at Lawrence Kirk recently? Possibly not, but the, there's a great separated junction went in there, so. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Hillside at Port Lethen. But, uh, Different hillside. Yeah, yeah, so hillside <laughs> Montrose, yes, yeah, a bit confusing. So, um, shall we, yeah, right, right to Transport Scotland with specific uh, requests and how, uh, in the letter um, about how, how they come to the, their decisions, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, agenda item uh, four is the second, continued as the second petition, PE1425 from Maureen Hartness on the adverse impact of DVLA local office closures. Members should note, of course, that this is a reserve matter and that the Scottish Government is actively engaging, engaging with the, the Department of Transport and the DVLA on the proposed office closures. Um, so uh, what action do you think we should take in relation to this petition? Anybody? I mean, given that it's a reserve matter, um, I'm not sure that there's much we can do if the Scottish Government is engaging with the uh, Department of Transport. Steve, are you going to have a suggestion? 
Uh, I think it was really a, a case of members taking a view on that. And I think our strong view is that, given that the government is actively pursuing this, that that should be um, uh, continued. And one option for the committee would be to close the petition, but in doing so, asking the Scottish government to keep it uh, uh, appraised of any any progress in that matter. Well, why don't we ask what the Scottish government, what the result of the Scottish government's active engagement is? Uh, and wait for that reply and then see what we do with this. Okay? Yeah. Right. That's agreed then. Agenda item five is subordinate legislation. We've got two negative instruments. Uh, the first instrument is the Housing Scotland Act 2001 assistance to registered social landlords and other persons. Grants Amendment Revocation Regulations 2012. This revokes a previous set of regulations and in doing so addresses the committee's concerns about the drafting of that instrument. The subordinate legislation committee has drawn the attention of the Parliament to the instrument on the basis that the Scottish Government has failed to meet the 28-day deadline. However, given that the instrument has been brought forward to allow the Scottish Government to address the serious concerns previously raised by the a subordinate legislation committee and this committee, the SLC is content to accept the government's justification. The committee is invited to consider any issues that it wishes to raise in reporting to Parliament on the instrument. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument. Does anyone have any comment on this instrument? No. So is the committee agreed that it doesn't wish to make any recommendations in relation to this yeah. instrument? Agreed. That is agreed. Thank you. The second instrument is the M74 motorway Fullerton Road to the M8 West of Kingston Bridge Speed Limit Regulations 2012. This instrument will allow the enforcement of new speed restrictions on the stretch of the M74, which has been subject to temporary speed restrictions. The SLC didn't raise any concerns in relation to this instrument. The committee is invited to consider any issues that it wishes to raise in reporting to Parliament on this instrument. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument either. Anybody got any comments? No. no. So uh, is the committee agreed that it doesn't wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. That is agreed. Um, as previously agreed, we'll uh, take the, rem the remainder of our business in private, but before we move into private uh, session, I'd like to record this committee's thanks to Malcolm uh, for his contribution to its work over the past 18 months, uh, subject, I think, to a decision at decision time today. Uh, he will take on the new role as a member of the <coughs> Finance Committee. So, Malcolm, we wish you all the best and thank you very much for your contribution to this committee. And I should also say that there's been another change in the committee team in that Lewis McNaughton is moving on to Spice for a six months economy anyway. So can we give him our best wishes as well? And I close the public part of the meeting.